Goodness me, everyone's phenomenally well behaved and disciplined. You're all sitting here without me having to call people in and ask people to be quiet and break up the conversation. Thank you very much. And a sunny, beautiful day as well. Um, very warm welcome to all of you. Thank you for being here. My name is Damendra Kanani. I'm Chief Operating Officer and Chief Spokesperson for Friends of Europe and the moderator for yours for the session, this uh, first two sessions on our very second uh, space Summit. Um, uh, we've been engaged, I think we're the only think tank in Europe um, that has be, had the privilege of um, establishing a space program, thanks to the European Space Agency, um, who took a bet on us to see if we can actually uh, raise the profile of the importance of space and how space matters, and hence um, our program, which is quite simply called making space matter. That's what we've been trying to do for the past three years. This is the third year that we're operating. And um, I suppose after our very first year, where we attempted to think through how space um, factors and features into both the economy and society and the politics of Europe. Here today, uh, we are starting with a different conversation on the eve of the elections. Next year, you know that we have the European elections, a new mandate emerging. And I suppose our big question will be, how will space feature and factor be a priority in the new mandate's work? Do the politicians actually get the importance of space? Do they understand how it contours, shapes, and structures our everyday lives? We had a conversation last night with some policymakers, and you know, someone actually said that you know, if you were to have a day without any satellite technology, what would that do to our lives? You cannot imagine how our lives would be uh, completely uh, changed and or stopped in terms of the things that we take for granted uh, uh, in everything we do. Would there would be a sudden change, um, almost a stop in all that we do. And we, we discussed the importance of actually how space is not only a tool, but a process through which we can actually improve our lives, uh, prevent things from happening, but also tackle some of the, one of the biggest challenges that we're all facing, which is climate change. Uh, and climate, and take actually using uh, space technologies as a way to help us not only understand the impact and the acceleration of climate change, but also what we might be able to do to protect communities, but how we might think about prevention, better farming, better ways to um, deal with population flows, etc., and so forth, um, you know, um, air pollution, uh, etc. So um, there's a great opportunity uh, that we hope that um, the, the new mandate will build on um, and think about the centrality of space as something which is a horizontal policy tool and process. So here this morning, uh, it gives me great pleasure to can I ask all our speakers to take their place here, please. Um, we're starting with a session um, which uh, uh, it says, please, we have, um, your names are there, don't worry, you've got to see. Um, mirroring Europe's values in space. So, you know, um, it was interesting in, in, the, in the discussions that we've had so far, that if you look at the development um, of space, and I mean by that, how continents and regions and countries have um, dealt with, responded to, um, engaged in the exploration of space, one might think, is there a value set underpinning the approaches? So often, often, and I'll, you know, I'm going to quote Michel Pratt, who's here, the head of the Brussels office, who's an absolute star, and said that, you know, one of, the, one of the differences is that we don't do what the Americans do. And the reason that, for that is our values in Europe. We don't have a Bezos. We don't have, you know, a, an approach of billionaires going into space. Um, we do worry about space debris. We do worry about security and, and the safety of space because of the fact that we have a set of values uh, that have, has underpinned Europe after a catastrophe and creating a project that, which is underpinned by a tag of, we shall never repeat that again. And so if you have that as your value base and your underpinning, let's say, uh, compass, that structures how you should and do do space. And I suppose for us, um, uh, as, a, as a think tank, we want to consistently, continually, whilst uh, um, continually impress upon all of all of our stakeholders the importance of those values. Because whilst we are called friends of Europe, we're not an uncritical friend of Europe. We think the project's the right thing to do, 
but we will be a critical friend of it, but we believe the values are important. So on that note, um, thank you, colleagues, for joining us um, and being with us here. I'm going to turn to Frederica first, you, and um, I suppose uh, you are someone who's involved in the international landscape uh, for, for, uh, for European Space Agency, and I suppose, can you share with us your thinking around how the integration of ESA uh, member states, so you are, you are not necessarily, your, the shape of you as, a, as an agency doesn't necessarily mirror the union. You are bigger in terms of different states outside the union. How is the integration of uh, th that, that policy, if you like, reflecting the values uh, uh, of space, uh, of, of Europe, but also how that is shaping European space policy? Over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for, for a very good introduction, by the way, of, uh, of this day. Um, so um, unlike uh, what is mentioned in the program, I'm not affiliated with Leiden University. I'm not advising the Dutch government. I'm Frederick Nordlund, uh, head of the European and External Relations uh, Department at ESA. <laughs> um, it's a real pleasure to, to, uh, to be with you this morning. And I would like uh, to start by going back in time if you allow me. Let's travel together 50 years back in time here in Brussels. We're July 31st, 1973, a beautiful summer day in Brussels, 50 years ago. That day, a minister in charge of science of Belgium, Mr. Charles Anna, actually chairs a meeting with 10 states um, interested in space. And that day, and Mr. Anna is a um, very smart negotiator, by the way. And that day, that very day, is formed the first package deal of the European Space Agency, meaning a flexible commonality of interest around a programmatic package that addresses space applications 1973, by the way, space applications, it was the first program addressing maritime navigation. That was what Europe was all about in 1973. The start of the Ariane program and uh, the uh, start of a provision of a laboratory for the space shuttle of NASA called Space Lab. That was the first package deal. And then, and only then, after that, discussions focused on the creation of the European Space Agency. Program first, organization next. And I wanted to go back in time and then fast forward to November 2022, the ESA Council and Ministerial level. 22 member states, four associate members halfway through the membership, four European cooperating states and the cooperating state Canada, which is the only non-European state uh, uh, actually uh, working with ESA. But that's not the story. The story is the European Commission, the EEAS, different EU agencies, USPA, um, UMETSAT, uh, the European Science Foundation, etc. all partners of the European Space Agency but first and foremost, the European Space Agency delivering and making sure it makes a difference through programmatic delivery to actually sustain a European space program. And again, the definition is programs serving a purpose and an objective. That is what defines profoundly ESA, that what grants ESA a legitimacy to act in Europe. But November 2022, things are, of course, very different compared to July 31st, 1973. First uh, and foremost, um, the action of the European Union in space is absolutely instrumental to make sure we can, we as a, an agency, work effectively with USPA, effectively with the European Commission, deliver the best services and data possible to serve the citizens. And believe me, ESA has come a long way to learn about that. Because again, 
I go back to 1973. We were focused on a series of programs meeting the member states' interest, of course, and we continue to do so. This is our prime um, uh, objective in life. But today, through uh, this um, partnership with the European Union, all institutions, we've learned a lot about how can we deliver something that makes a difference to the European citizens. It's not the end of the road. We keep going at this, but we have really uh, learned um, a tremendous amount. And by the way, at the, the council meeting um, at ministerial level in November, ISA could um, uh, convince member states to actually invest in RE Square, uh, invest in the new infrastructure that would make a difference for information security in Europe. Um, you know, we're adding to the European infrastructure to deliver critical services. But now I would like to maybe um, focus on, uh, let's say, questions for the future, if you allow me, just for two or three more minutes. Mm -hmm. First of all, I, I mentioned citizens, and I'm sitting next to Roya here, and she knows better than anybody else, uh, you know, the reality of the ground. And we have to really improve and definitely improve fast on this. Because and we were discussing uh, among ourselves uh, in the speaker corner just before coming here. One of the prime concerns of the citizens in Europe at the moment is a very, very, very short term concern. What will happen this summer to me? What will be the consequences of droughts, of uh, the heat wave or the heat dome? Uh, what can you do for me to make a difference in this? Can you help me? I have a house, by the way, there, and uh, I, 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 I fear uh, these forest fires that, can, that could come uh, along, and what can you do about this? On purpose, I'm listing all kinds of things, and I know it will, human security will be discussed in a dedicated panel, so I don't want to expand. But we are f the message here is that we're fully aware of the task ahead. And believe me, the best answer to that is the lineup, the most productive lineup of all the institutions in Europe to care for this. And I think this is a fundamental uh, mission. We have challenges, and I would like to conclude with this. Um, yesterday, we had a, a, a fantastic dinner, and thank you again for hosting uh, us at this dinner. And I was sharing the fact that I'm in a very privileged position to travel the world for ESA and to look at what is going on uh, in space outside of Europe. And what I note is the following. First of all, the public investment outside of Europe is at an historic high. So it means that public funding for space in the US, in China, in India, in South Korea, etc., is at an historic high. Uh, we have in our um, um, internal discourse in Europe a tendency to quite naturally focus on uh, you know, our relationship with the private sector, with the new space sector, and etc., which is, of course, exactly what we should do. But we should not lose sight that public funding is really instrumental for us and elsewhere, and visibly outside of Europe, that's exactly what they do. They increase the public funding. Why? For science, for research and development, for increasing um, their chances to field transformative technologies and services. And so my message again is competition internationally is extremely high. We need to care in Europe for science. 1962, I'm going even further back in time, Science, uh, there were two prominent figures in Europe, Pierre Auger and Eduardo Almadi. Those two were the, you, you know, the initiators of the European Space Programme. And what they had in mind was space science in Europe is the motivation to do it at the European level, to, to join forces around science. I think we should be very careful uh, not to lose sight of the investment in science in Europe. And I mean, it, I mean it like for Earth science, we have to fight to, to be a world leader. We say Copernicus is the best system in the world, yes, but we have to keep investing in Earth science. We have to keep investing in these future measurements that will make sure that not only we become the first carbon neutral continent by 2050, yes, that's the objective, 
But if, even more than that, before we have to keep going to sustain <clears throat> our leadership position on this, and it takes efforts, it takes public funding, it takes partnership with the private sector, it takes a full lineup of the institutions, and believe me, international competition in this domain is extremely high. So I think that is a, a message. Finally, um, all along and with partners like UMEDSAT and etc., cetera, um, Europe elected to be a world leader in certain domains of space activities. For example, let me give you one. Gaia is the Google Earth of our galaxy, of the Milky Way. So it means we are, we, we in Europe, through ESA, map in 3D our galaxy. And by mapping in 3D our galaxy, we provide the reference system for the world, for all the astrophysicians to work on. So we are the center of this domain. This is critical for the future. Where should we elect to be world leaders? We have elected to be world leaders with Galileo and Copernicus and other systems, but that's not the end of the story. We have now to discuss this among all of us to make sure we have a collective alignment on and a clarity of purpose to make sure Europe becomes a world leader in other domains, well chosen, but then, and that's my final two messages, this needs, space is about long cycles. So it needs, as you rightly say, to be able to convince the, after elections, the incoming team of the criticality to sustain the same level of investment because these choices are putting Europe front and center in critical domains. And that's not an easy task. Final message, um, this day will address our cooperation with Africa. And I wanted to just say a quick message about that because this is a top priority for Europe, definitely. And I think um, uh, we have a, already a long legacy of partnership with Africa, with many different institutions. And along the way, we've learned a lot of different lessons and I would like to share three. One is we have to be ready to learn out of what comes in from Africa because believe me, they are far more advanced than that when you think about the utilization of data and services. We have to continue working on this. In, in ESA, we, we are very fortunate to have member states investing in dedicated programs for Africa. And uh, Eleni, you here, you know that, EO for Africa and others. But um, we have to be ready to learn uh, together with our African partners. Second, we have to lead by our own example. And our Director General tasked us with a very challenging mission. Zero debris by 2030. ESA should be a zero debris organization by 2030. If we do it, and this is challenging, we hope that others will follow our example. And this is what Europe is all about, in my opinion. We first apply it to ourselves in order then to be influential in the rest of the community. And last but not least, I think uh, Europe should at all times be a trusted partner, and that's exactly what we should be doing uh, with our African partner. Thank you very much. Patrick, thank you very, very much. Um, I gave you the space. You took much longer than five minutes, uh, but that's absolutely fine because it was very, very thoughtful um, and challenging. But I love the way you created this time, this kind of time uh, line to your presentation. But you know what it, it kind of punctuates is that <clears throat> when you reflect on the time that it's taken to get to this point, when you reflected 50 years ago, the, the time span, or the, rather the timeline of change is accelerating. So what's happened in 50 years and what's happened in five, in the past five, it's phenomenal if you were to just think about it. And I suppose we need to understand that the pace of change of technological prowess and R&D, especially in the sector that has very little illumination, which is the private sector, if we aren't mindful of the role of government to regulate, to, to be a guardian of, uh, of some of our safety in the broadest sense, but also to be the guardian of uh, supporting research and development so that we can be world leaders. Um, it's, really, it's really critical that we have what you call this um, 
alignment of the ecology, and I'll come back to you, and people hope that you will ask questions about that, is that how do you, how do you create this lineup? Because um, is there not a sense of more competition than allegiance to a one Europe approach? Because that's what you're talking about, is that how do you convince agencies across Europe to, in the context of world competition, and there is, you absolutely know what's happened in the past two years, is that how do you create a one Europe approach amongst agencies? So let's come back to that. In a Roy, I want to turn to you. <laughs> so are we really pleased that you're here because you bring that regional perspective. You are the agency of the regions, etc. And um, as I suppose, well, share with us how you fit into this ecology, in sp space corporation, because people will think regions and space, mm, really? What does that mean? So explain to us what you do, but answer that question about, the, you know, are you treated as an equal partner? Do you fit into that ecology? And what you think needs to change in the environment we find ourselves right now? Because yeah. you are closer to reality than most of the agencies on that panel. I mean that with all respect, fellows. fellows. <laughs> Go ahead. Thanks for your introduction, which is very precise and uh, gives me space to d develop. I think it's difficult to be the speaker after you. It was very, very um, inspiring and illustrative. Uh, we are much younger than ESA, but we share a lot of speaking about values of the, the sessions is mirroring Europe's values. We share a lot of values. And um, maybe to start with um, why, what is the raison d'etre from Nereos? It's really through the creation of Nereos materialized the, the change in space. When Nereus was created um, in the space world, you made the step from um, space being a subject for an only institutional subject for national agencies, contracting agencies um, with missions uh, into space. With the creation of Nereus, it was about using space data and services here on planet Earth. The, the, the raison d'etre was that the local and uh, regional authorities realized there are two European space systems that produce services and information that are actually, to a large um, amount, targeted at public authorities. And they said, oh, we don't know about these um, systems and we need a common platform to work together and we think interregional cooperation, pooling together resources and it's often a question of brains, of people, pulling them together, pulling resources together to do something, um, exchanging ideas, sharing knowledge, sharing best practices, this is really at the heart empowers us better to use the system. <coughs> so Nereos is about empowering regions, citizens, companies of using the benefits of space. And doing it so through, through themselves, the, the platform creates its own energy, its own competence, it contributes, and skills development, capacity building is a very important element of our work. This year we have the, the year of uh, skills, and um, we firmly believe, uh, we can, you sp spoke about competition, if we want to stay globally competitive, we can build the most fantastic systems if we don't have the next generation that follows that really has the excellence in science and technologies to continue with the systems, we, our investment was uh, in vain. And, and this is where we work. If um, you pin it down, we are really uh, a, an organization by civil society. Regions, in our understanding, are the level next to the national state. But regions are also organized in all the different uh, European countries different. And that's also a, a, a problem of ours on, and a challenge. You have German region, German lender that are very powerful. They are very strong um, uh, financially, economically. If you take, for instance, the three regions in the south in Germany, Bavaria, Baden-Württemberg and Hesse, where the banking quarter is, their um, research budget outweighs the national one. Mm. 
and uh, 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 in other countries, regions are really tiny. You have in Europe a very small country. The 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 if you take Luxembourg, if you take Malta, uh, uh, the 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 level of a region is very low. But it is the level that is the closest to the. Um, citizen and it is when we are talking about and that is what is Nereus about bringing space horizontally to the other policies to other sectors and um, if you look at the regional level in the one of the, the biggest EU budgets are implemented at the local and regional level. Agriculture, second column of the agriculture um, budget, um, the regional structural funds are implemented at the local and regional level. And there we work really to extract, to get out the information, the knowledge from the satellite imagery and transform it into useful information for the public sector and for companies. And regions see themselves in, in two respects concerned. One as a user, as a public user of this information and services. But also, on the other hand, in a strategic context. Regions um, define regional development strategies, economic strategies, and in that respect, space plays nowadays an important role. It uh, plays a role for the creation of new employment, high-level employment, business opportunities, creation of new business communities, and there to have really a, a common European approach. Um, climate change was another topic that was addressed and um, there we at regional level are in the first row. Um, in many European regions you see the impact of climate change very dramatically in everyday life, in the territory and in the everyday life of the citizen, in production lines, in the agriculture sector and there regions start adopting a more strategic approach. Regions look more into satellite imagery. They start defining um, data exploitation strategies. They start defining strategies how better to use space data and services and um, pool the, the, the players together. Talking about values in this respect, it's for us very important we regard space as a common good. Yeah. And we see it depends on your, it's accessible for everyone in Europe and it depends on your own attitude, on your own energy to access this, to develop the skills, to develop the, the capacities, to grasp the knowledge from the satellite imagery. And if you ask me what do we need more in Europe, we need more corporations, we need more training, capacity building activities, so that this knowledge can be drawn. We need strong model projects showing what can you do with space. Um, for us, everything starts with a vision. Also, ESA wouldn't exist if the forefathers didn't have the vision. If I don't can imagine what I can do with space, what I can accomplish, how I can respond to climate change um, challenges, I can't do it. This is the, the starting point. Mm. Roy, do you think mayor, <coughs> mayors across Europe get it? Do they get space? So if you were to speak to mayors, so I spoke to um, just three years ago, just before COVID actually, uh, we were working very closely with Eurocities and you know, um, uh, the regions um, uh, organization. So they were invited me to speak at their kind of national convention. And we just landed the, the, the work with ESA. And I spoke to them about the importance of space. And it was like, as if I'd come from Mars. Um, really, there was like, really, what's he talking about? And I was explaining how it could imp you know, improve their governance, their decision making, how if they actually adopted better space, uh, space policy data information locally, it would transform some of the most poorest areas as well as their, their resilience and capabilities. And they really, I could have been a Martian. Um, and they were just like looking at me as if like, you are Really, we've got other things to worry about. And do you, do you think at the local level people get it? Is it improving? Thank you for this very concrete question. Now, if I'm honest, it's a huge challenge. And we have that to be means no, right? No, it's not no. 
it means we are on our way, and it's a long and hard way, um, and we have worked very hard. Um, but I think it is very hard because um, politicians don't like to get engaged with space. Space is regarded a specialist topic, and also when I go and want to speak with the politician, there is not so much um, employment behind space. It's still a niche sector. So the, 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 the employment in, in all the countries is, it's like you, you can draw um, attention, but with climate change, as with civil emergencies becoming more and more frequent in Europe, that changes. There, it's not, space is not uh, uh, a nice to have, space is not a specialist, Matthias, space concerns saving life, and this is where, where it changed, and where we work together also with the European Space Agency and the European Commission in our flagship initiative Copernicus for Regions, mm. where we develop good material targeted at the political level very for a non um, specialist audience with videos with a really simple tool showing what are the benefits and that space is not a nice to have but a must saving lives mm. um, our member region in Italy mm. Emilia Romana they just had a big flood and there you can really change show how much space satellite imagery changes Great, thank you. I mean, um, thank you very much, and thank you for responding uh, to my challenging question. But it's, it's important, isn't it? Because actually, if at the municipal level, if citizens and mayors and others don't get it, we are simply going to lose the race, uh, or ra rather lose the opportunity of making sure that politicians understand the centrality of space and how we can improve people's lives and communities' lives and, more broadly, um, our, uh, I suppose, our future resilience as a continent and as a political space. And it feels like, you know, in the mind of the ordinary citizen, it's about the rocket, Star Wars, and, you know, um, do I really understand that my mobile phone relies a little bit on a bit of this? And I suppose that we need to understand that, I suppose, how do we ensure that, you know, less than half a mile away, you have all these lovely taxpayer um, MEPs sitting there. How do they, un how can we ensure that they understand this topic? And how do we make sure that this is, you know, brought into the political arena in a way that's not about fear, but about opportunity and actually improving stuff? I want to take reactions from people here in the room uh, before I uh, invite the, uh, the remaining two speakers to conclude this um, opening session. So, um, any reactions, any thoughts? Lovely. But just wait one second, Will, as a mic making its way to you. A microphone. There you go. And please do introduce yourself. It's on. It's on? Okay. I am Mrs. Baromska. I, was, I am a retiree from the European Union uh, Commission. I just have a question because you were talking about floods in Italy. But um, we had floods in Belgium and in Germany at the same time, not so long ago. Mm -hmm. But you were not able um, to uh, prevent, uh, not, not to prevent the flood, but to inform the, inform the, the, the people in due time so that they, they flee or they... Are the satellite images today able to foresee what's going to happen and to uh, inform the, the population so that they leave their homes and get safe somewhere. Okay, we'll come back to that. It's a really important point. It's a very important question. Is that you know what's the the um, I suppose the quality of let's say data, the imagery, and the speed with which it can be communicated to terrestrial beings, um, and what's the methodology for that? And I don't think we have a methodology worked out, to be honest with you. But the experts in the room can answer some of that questions. Any other? <coughs> Gentlemen here, please, again, by far the youngest person in the room. <laughs> Hi, I'm David Eagleson from the University of Cambridge. Uh, you spoke a bit about capacity building, and I'm just curious to hear a bit more about what's currently being done to, to build capacity in more member states so that they can participate more actively, and what more you, you think could be done. Okay, great. I like threes. Let's have another one. Just the third question. Someone. Ah, thank you. Again, introduce yourself, please, sir. Um, uh, Asad Beg, working in the European External Action Service on Pan-African ah. Affairs. 
Um, you mentioned cooperation for Africa uh, at the end with your three three point plan. You mentioned you should be a trusted partner. Can you define what what do you mean by trust and who what do you mean by untrusted partners? <laughs> maybe thank you. We oh, we've got within a circle of friends. Here. No, thank, no, absolutely. Thank you. Usually, don't get this kind of spice first thing you know, in the first session. Thank you all for responding to making really good questions. So, Pat, you know, Frederick, can I ask you to go first? Um, you know, what does trusted mean? Sure. Um, trusted partner is um, first and foremost. Uh, clarity of rules of engagement. So you have to be extremely clear on how you want to engage, on what, and for what purpose. And then all the way, and it happens that, for example, uh, the European Space Agency is a multi-year budgeted agency compared to annual uh, you know, budgets in some, most of the cases for our international partners. Trusted means Clarity of purpose, clarity of delivery, and learning together all along. And let me just say a word about Africa. The first Meteosat mission in Europe was developed by the European Space Agency. Thank God now UMETSAT is our partner and they're doing a much better job at, than us, you know, to exploit the systems and to keep going, by the way, MTG, I-1 mission is just a fantastic mission that was launched, a Meteosat third generation uh, satellite that was launched last December, and that is delivering critical data, but uh, okay. First Meteosat project, what do we see from the satellite from geostationary orbit? Africa before Europe. So early on, we engaged Africa in meteorology because we felt this was the good way to go because <laughs> it was we, we were aiming at you know, operational meteorological uh, services in Europe, but we had African partners just right in plain sight of our geostationary satellite. Now we have, over a multi-decade engagement, um, uh, made sure that we would actually work very closely with many different national space agencies in Africa, and you know there are many. By the way, the, the latest is uh, the Senegalese Agency for uh, Space Studies, which was created last, last March. So we're engaging SANSA in South Africa, GGPEN in Angola, uh, NASNA in Nigeria, CRTS in Morocco, you name it, all of them. ESA has infrastructure in Africa, so we are actually also engaging our partners along the infrastructure uh, among different projects. But I think the most successful cooperation with Africa along the way was the thematic projects that we developed along like uh, water cycles in Africa. Uh, I think we are really probably a world leader in this type of uh, activity, uh, not just in Africa, but we were discussing this this morning. What an interesting story. 20 years of the Tiger project, water cycle in Africa, is returning back to Europe fantastic lessons learned in order to apply them to the south of Spain at the moment. Water cycles. Mm -hmm. Very interesting return. While, and that's what I meant, but we have to learn together. And so a trusted partner to me is, of course, being able to be all along committing and um, delivering on your commitment, but more than that, again, learning together. Just a quick note on capacity building and your question about uh, you know, what, what is going on. Just the ESA experience in, the, in, in less than a minute. <clears throat> we have EU member states, not members of ESA. We are working with them on dedicated ESA projects with ESA standards, with uh, expected deliveries at that particular level to prepare them, of course, to go to the next level. But not just that we are also uh, noticing an incredible level of creativity in using all of the available content that there is. And <clears throat> it saddens me that uh, one of these companies in one of uh, this uh, your EU member state uh, was becoming a world leader, and I will not say more than that, in, in a particular space application, and it was acquired by a US company recently because in the US they didn't make any mistake. They immediately saw the creativity and they wanted to acquire it. So we're good at capacity building, but I think we should be even better at using what we are building up with them for our benefit. 
Rhea, that, that, thank you very much for that, that point. If you could address that point about um, how space technologies are helping local communities to understand uh, the immediacy of something happening, but also to be able to use data so that in real time you can flag and create a warning system um, for both, you know, in this situation here we're about floods, but other such areas like, you know, fires, or we can see uh, that actually there, are, there is a change of wind and something's going to happen in a five hours time. How do you, are you doing that kind of stuff? So how do you help that, that um, capability on, in real time? Um, we are really at a, a step before really, sh I mean, having the, the um, uh, ambition that satellite imagery has to tell before and save all the people so they can leave their home is very ambitious. I, maybe we can get there at one point, but what it is at the moment that satellite imagery helps, gives information in the whole um, civil emergency circle. Of course, in the prevention, they can see from the territories or they can see from the water temperature, but they can't predict in that way. What we do as a platform is showing example, best practice sharing, showing what are um, successful administrations doing, portraying these cases, bringing um, public authorities that have these um, experiences to the floor to discuss with other public authorities, bringing also the national level in to discuss, making different regions and different member states cooperating and sharing information and knowledge. Is okay, that great. Approach? No, thanks. But I think what, and this is not a, this is, don't, don't regard this as a good, but th th therein lies the rub, actually, is that on the one hand, we want to make this something that space should matter to people, but we can't actually provide the uh, compelling case of how it'll affect people's lives on a daily basis. Or, you know, you've got sharing of information and data, et cetera, but how do you create the infrastructure where this, you know, this, this person's question can be answered on the street quite, quite quickly, that actually this is capable, this is, there is a possibility of that. And I'm aware that it's possible, it's just that we haven't created the infrastructure, but perhaps, Michelle, can I, someone bring the mic here at the front, please? Do introduce yourself for the sake of yes, the audience. Yes, Michel Pratt from the ESA Brussels office. I just want to react because there's a difference between an agency responsible for R&D uh, or an agency responsible to link uh, the regions and the civil protection. Yeah. What is space? Space is data transformed in information. That's already a first step. And then the information has to be used by the political system, by the institutions, be it being national or regional, in order to protect uh, the population. But that's a different role. The role of an agency is to have an infrastructure, is to produce data that will be transformed in information, and then with this information, the political uh, institutions have to react. Okay. Uh, gentlemen, we have two hands up, and I'm, I'm conscious of the fact, colleagues, I'm going to bring you both in, I promise. And you may have answers to these questions, but there's nothing like having an active audience for a debate. So, lady first, and then yourself. Do introduce yourself. Uh, I wanted to have a different angle of a debate. You mentioned in the, your introductory remarks that uh, Europe needs a vision and that we need to decide uh, uh, in which areas we are going to be leaders. And I wanted to ask you if you were the person who would decide where else Europe needs to lead in space, what areas that would be. Thank you. Great, thank you. And the gentleman there at the back. Yeah, I won't bring you in at the moment, for Frederick. I'll bring you at the end on this, if you don't mind. It gives you also time to think about it. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, citizens. My name is Angelos Karlaftis, Epaphos Advisors. We represent here Urania and Helios Space and Defence uh, European and Mediterranean Group. Uh, the question is, uh, we believe uh, uh, the last uh, 10 years that we have to uh, strengthen our abilities to the resources area, where Japan is very good. Uh, so we believe we are trying to organise citizens' communities for Mars colonization in the future. The Americans are very good. The Chinese lately, they are also very good. Uh, and the, it's not only the question that we have to, to, to be directed towards a resource instead of 
getting the resources from our planet, to getting from the comets, from other uh, planetary uh, bodies. Uh, and about the ladies, about the flood, uh, of course, we have uh, already, it's working from 2012, uh, a platform from the Copernicus system for the flood awareness, which the citizens, they, they get predictions for 10 days. Lately, for example, yesterday we got from Ukraine, where they were bombed, uh, a kind of, they have a flood because of uh, terrorist action, and uh, we are managing right now to move uh, 20,000 citizens outside of a flood which uh, was created by this terrorist action. So we have these abilities. I don't know what happened with Belgium or in Germany, but we have the platform. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much for sharing that information. I'm going to go straight into our, our, our other panelists before we come back. Uh, and so first I want to sp you know, turn to our colleague from the uh, Belgium agency uh, that deals with um, a space and a science, I suppose, science, uh, science research. So really, um, um, Share with us, would you, um, the kind, I suppose, the, the developments that you are able to progress in terms of funding of research, I suppose, so the role you have and where we are at it, but how does, what is, what is it the role that you're playing to, I suppose, up the game for better cooperation on science, scientific research and development on space matters? Over to you. Yeah, thank you. Right, thank you. Um, well, maybe just uh, first of all, uh, as you said, uh, Belspo is the Belgian, um, the, the organization at the federal ministry uh, responsible for research and innovation. Um, but those of you, it, it might be useful to, to just give in a, in a nutshell a, a short overview of the Belgian research and innovation system because mm -hmm. it has some particularities. You should, those of you who are familiar with it should know that it is um, very decentralized. Uh, we, we spoke about regions a moment ago. In Belgium, um, the bulk of the responsibilities for, for science policy and for innovation policy is situated at the regional level. The federal level complements it with a set of dedicated actions. Those are physical, uh, fiscal measures to support uh, R&D and innovation. These are dedicated programs that complement what is done at the regional level. And um, we are also responsible for the investments uh, in, uh, in space at an international level. That means that we are uh, responsible for Belgian contribution to ESA. And the particularity of, uh, to get the picture complete, you should know that um, in Belgium, we don't have a we don't have a space agency. Uh, we rely on ESA as our space agency. It's a long ongoing debate. There have been recently some political discussions on it, but once again, the the outcome was clear. Uh, we rely on ESA for that. Um, and what's also very particular is that our investment in space, which is considerable, is is for the most being channeled through ESA. There are some national and regional investments, but they are very low compared to the global investment. Um, another point that I would like to pick up, in, so, so we are working on space in a, in a true European spirit, through ESA, through the, the programs, uh, the space programs of, of the Commission, of course, um, and, and well, it has been said, I think, by the first speaker, eh? we are also uh, one of the in initiative takers to, to um, launch the, the, the creation of the European Space Agency, because there is a firm belief in Belgium that space taking into account the, the vastness of the matter, the challenges it confronts, that you cannot do it alone. That cooperation is essential to go forward in space. And that is uh, at um, the, 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 the basis of our philosophy and on our science philosophy. We are being investing from the beginning at a high level and very constantly, allowing um, the development of, of expertise at, at a, a whole series of, of domains. Uh, what is also another particularity of, of Belgium is that we don't have uh, the big players, the big primes. We all we have dedicated uh, companies and RTOs, um, which have um, a very high experience, but in niches, which allows them to be present in a series, uh, well, in the majority of, of domains uh, in space, be it earth observation, be it science. Um, so, so we have a very horizontal, innovation-driven approach. Um, one of the points that was raised was how, how uh, about research infrastructures. Yeah. Um, I would briefly come back to that. I think there's a whole, since, since um, several years now, uh, Europe took the initiative to, to foster um, the creation of integrated uh, infrastructures for research. 
it was done on Earth via the S3 forum, which allowed to um, bring experience from different uh, European levels together and then to, to enhance the impact of research infrastructures, which are at the basis of excellent science, because there are three points there that are uh, essential. Research central uh, integrated uh, research infrastructures, they foster collaboration and knowledge sharing between the entities that are participating. They also uh, optimize, they optimize the investment, because if you integrate it, uh, you are avoiding, avoiding a duplication of investment, a duplication of services. So it should increase uh, the efficiencies. And it's another point that was uh, raised by um, my neighbors. It also uh, fosters and facilitates uh, data accessibility and data analysis, which is key. Those are points that are used uh, in a logic for, for uh, research infrastructures on, on Earth, but they also, uh, the same logic applies to research uh, infrastructures in space, even more, taking into account the difficulties, um, or the, let's say, not call it, uh, don't call it difficult, but the challenging environment where you have to work in, the cost that it brings to, to, to build and to create structures. And, and coming back to values, I think um, mirror, defending the European values in space, it should be integrated, and it is integrated, in the design of the programs and the actions that, are being, that, that we do. Um, by facilitating data access, by offering easy data access, open data access, closed when necessary, but, but with a maximum openness, um, by, by collaborating with other uh, partners from abroad, by making science data available uh, for, for, for non-European partners to work on it. And by the design, we, we, we foster our values. The challenge we might have is that the more you invest, the stronger you are positioned to do this kind of uh, activities. And that is the debate that is going on the last years. I think uh, should, should Europe continue to invest, increase its investments in space to keep up pace with the other, uh, with China, with the United States, in order to remain a, a strong uh, partner that, that can um, defend its values, that can spread them around. I'll limit myself uh, to this first. Frank, if, if I may, just one, one thing. I mean, you know, you're relatively, you know, Belgium is relatively small. Um, its budget is, you know, uh, if you compare it to France and Germany, uh, you know, very minuscule in terms of size of, of the budget. Do you collaborate with other regions uh, or uh, um, other cities or uh, member states on scientific research? Are you doing that at the moment? Well, in space, we do it de facto since we work through ESA. Mm -hmm. um, what we do in Belgium, of course, because there we have the case that is that we, we, we are a kind of uh, embryo of the European way of working. We have a very intense dialogue within Belgium. Uh, I'm also responsible for fostering the, the intra-Belgian dialogue on, on science and innovation between mm -hmm. all the different entities. So we talk with each other. Okay. We take into account... And of course, we have, as, as all countries, bilateral agreements and multilateral agreements with other, uh, with other partners. But, but we are firmly convinced that the European instruments are very important for, and there is a whole scale of instruments, be it in space, be it on art, to foster different kinds of collaborations via the framework programs, via the ESO programs. Mm -hmm. A part of that, we have, of course, additional bilateral agreements. Okay, all right. But, I mean, you sort of answered the question, but it occurs to me that we need to um, have, if we, talk, if we go back to where uh, Frederic started us about everyone lining up, one of the things that needs to line up if we're going to make sure we do space better is the R&D capability within Europe. And so, therefore, that has to be much more integrated and aligned so that we are being able to, uh, you know, uh, get bang for our buck, but actually be bigger uh, than what we need to, you know, than we, than we are in this particular territory, but something for people to chew on. I want to move directly to Rodrigo. Last but not least, uh, I'm sorry that I've kept you waiting. Um, Rodrigo, you're, you know, um, to a certain extent, you are a new player uh, in this space, a new agency, if you like. And um, people will be wondering, you know, what, what, what do you do in, in relation to the European Space Agency? So say, just spend 60 seconds, you know, 60 seconds or so just explaining uh, US, uh, uh, SBA. But 
what's you know what how how are you um, reflecting in your work this notion of better cooperation aligned with EU values and what some of the what are the challenges that you see ahead of you uh, as this as a new agency? Over to you, Rodrigo. Sure. Thank you. thank you very much. First of all, thank you to uh, Friends of Europe for the invitation. Good morning, um, everyone. I, I will actually inverse the answer because it's probably easier and more, uh, more logical. And then, in the end, if you allow me, I would like to come back to one of Please. one or the other questions that were asked in the audience that I found um, very, very interesting. Uh, the first thing is uh, at USP, of course, we are working uh, on the youth space program in a, in, a, in 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 different areas, uh, in part partnership, of course, with the Commission, with the European Space Agency. Um, and we have to think first, I mean, the, the youth space program is a tool to implement policies, to implement policies of the Union, policies that, answers to the, that answer to Union priorities. Um, and and these, in the priorities comes the relationship, uh, of course, with the values. Now, space contributes to many of the priorities of the European Union, probably most significantly to four of them. Um, the first of one is the implementation of the Green Deal. Uh, the implementation of the Green Deal is a, is, is a big challenge. Um, certainly there is a lot that can be done in many domains, and space can help in many of those domains. We are talking about things such as smart cities, more efficient agriculture, better transport, be it road, rail, aviation, etc. All that benefits from space. And if you increase the efficiency, you reduce the environmental footprint, so you become closer to implement the Green Deal objectives. The second is the transition to the digital age, everything that is related to digitalization. Things like, for example, Internet of Things are enabled by space. Uh, certainly space creates a very large amounts of data, and the processing of that data is a challenge per se. Uh, the third element, uh, it was already uh, mentioned here and there, uh, is the element of the strategic autonomy of the, Euro of, of the Union. Uh, <clears throat> and space has a crucial contribution to the strategic autonomy. Strategic autonomy does not mean independence or isolation. It means to collaborate when we have to collaborate. And we, for example, on disaster management, we collaborate. There is a lot of collaboration between the Union and many other regions around the world. But also the ability of being autonomous when it is strategically necessary. This is why, for example, Galileo can work independently from GPS. This is why Copernicus can collect data independent from any other system. The fourth element, fourth priority, <coughs> is related to resilience. Resilience through innovation, so making sure that we have an innovative uh, sector, in particular an innovative sector that uses space data and uses space services. Now, uh, these of course are the priorities that orientate all the activities of the Youth Space Programme, and our role in the Space Programme is actually quite simple to explain uh, in the sense that uh, we we are a service provider, so we are providing Agnos and Galileo services. Um, we are uh, uh, developing the GovSat Com Hub capabilities. We are working also on space surveillance and tracking starting very soon. And on uh, many of these things, we do it in a very close partnership with the Euro uh, European Space Agency. Um, the Galileo satellites that we exploit, that we operate, they are designed and built under the authority of the European Space Agency as the de de design authority for the program. So we pick up those assets and put them in operation, in execution. The second thing um, that we do is to secure the systems, because we not only need space data that is available and reliable, but also that is secure. Mm -hmm. So everything that is related to the security of the systems, uh, be it the physical security, the cyber security, but also the utilization of those systems for security-related missions. For example, public regulated service of, uh, um, of, of Galileo. Last element is making sure that all these investments come to the final user, which is about utilization. So fostering the use, fostering the use by the private sector, fostering the use also in policies. We have excellent examples at policy level where, uh, where actually uh, space data is now being used and has to be used. E-call regulation, E112, I mean, there's a number of, of examples for those of you familiar with them. Um, coming back to the questions, I wanted to reflect very briefly because I know Time is almost up. Um, uh, I would like to mention three things. First thing is, and I think 
in the end, we will all agree, space will not solve all our problems. Space is not a solution for everything. Uh, and, and we should be clear about saying that. <laughs> Nevertheless, space helps us solve many problems. And it is already helping us today. When we look, for example, search and rescue at sea, today, about 2,000 lives every year are saved because we have space-based capabilities, COSPAR SARSAT, where Galileo plays a key fundamental role. Our coast guards are being alerted of boats sinking in our coasts, and this results in 2,000 lives saved. It's an example. Today, uh, already today, uh, civil protections are activating uh, the Copernicus uh, emergency service, for example, in case of wildfires. This is happening, it happens, uh, and now, of course, with summer coming, we see an increase of the activations, but these emergency services are activated as well uh, in case of floods, in case of uh, uh, any natural disaster, any natural catastrophe. Um, space data is helping us to plan. It's helping us to plan cities, it's helping us to plan forests, it's helping us to plan agricultures, offices, Governmental agencies are using today already space data on their planning to make agriculture, forestry more sustainable, but also safer and decrease the impact on the environment. There is still a lot to do as well. This is the other message. Of course, uh, we still didn't exhaust the possibilities on how space can help us. Things like, for example, the development of governmental secured communication capabilities, mm -hmm. Iris Square, mentioned by Frederick. Today, governments need this, need this also for civil protection needs. Um, uh, if we look, for example, the utilization of more uh, precise data, more accurate earth, earth observation data for flood prevention, yes, of course, that can be done. There is still way ahead to develop. The last thing I would mention, and maybe to, to close the loop with your introduction, um, because you, meant, you mentioned that friends of Europe are there also to be critical friends of Europe. Allow me to be a critical friend of friends of Europe. <laughs> Sorry for the How um, very You dare have you. showed at a certain point in time, there was in a picture, uh, a, I don't know if you can project it again, there was a lady with a, with a mobile phone that had some problems in booking a meeting. Uh, I don't know if you, can, if you can pick up that image quickly. That image said, uh, my GPS is not working. Two things. First, probably it's not the sat satellite navigation that is not working. It's actually her mobile phone that is not working. Second, we really need to do an effort on, in Europe to stop talking about GPS and start talking about Galileo. It is three times more precise, and it is ours. So, if I may, a, a, critical, a critical friendship to the friends of you. Well done. No, thank you very much, Rodrigo. Um, it was worth, uh, worth the wait and, uh, to have you uh, at the end, actually, to round this conversation up so well. If you were, I mean, let me just ask all of you, and I'm going I'm to you know, eat into your break for a little bit. I love the notion of let, let's talk about, stop talking about GPS, talk about Galileo. I'm not sure if the narrative will switch on the street, especially as people won't understand, even know what Galileo is. Um, but, however... Um, if you, you know, you asked a question, the vision for Europe, let's say, what would be your number one priority for next year for the new uh, college of commissioners entering? Um, and they will be in charge of a timeline where a lot is being talked about 2030. So the stakes are up and high. What would be the one thing you'd say to them? I'm going to ask all of you that, if I may. Certainly, if I, if, and if I may start, okay, in addition, of course, to the continuation of the ongoing activities, um, certainly the priority is in the relationship between space and our security. I mean, uh, probably most of you, like myself, were shocked this morning by opening the news and seeing what is happening in, uh, in Zaporizhia, in Nova Karkova, uh, with the dam being destroyed. I mean, our, uh, our security is becoming more and more in the focus, uh, and certainly the connection between space and security is there. Uh, from our point of view, uh, this is really a very operational uh, relationship. How can we use the data, the services, those that are there and those that will come soon, in order to help the civil protection, the police forces, the fire brigades, but as well our defense forces? And I think this will be clearly in the picture. Uh, I mean, it's going to be the top priority uh, for the year, years to come. 
Thank you. Um, and I can see that in our work with European Space Agency, the one thing we haven't sp spent a lot of time in is the whole issue about space, and, um, uh, space defense and security, which is obviously an, it's an area of our expertise, but we haven't integrated it sufficiently enough into the space discussion. Frank, over to you. What about you? What would be the one priority? Well, it's always a challenge to come up with one. I know. I, uh, I agree also with, with uh, Rodrigo that uh, civil and space security is a very important issue, but I, th I would be uh, very um, down to earth. I would urge the commissioner to come up and, and come to uh, institutional agreements between all the European uh, space actors to make a front in the changing ecosystem. Great. Thank you very much. Roy? Thank you. Um, I think we have in all European countries also a bit the problem that extremist groups getting stronger. And I think having a really good campaign showing what we have accomplished in space, in Europe, and how that addresses um, challenges in the safety security context, in the climate change context, that bringing this benefits, showing those benefits, bringing it really closer to the citizen, that they kind of realize it's very, we are very privileged living in politically stable, in this politically stable continent. Thank you. Frederick? Okay, I cannot, I cannot pick the same ones. I mean, I have to pick another one, of course. Um, if I would address a commissioner, an incoming commissioner, I mean, I would realize that that particular commissioner would be interested in owning a new initiative. It's very often the case, I think. So what would be that initiative that the new commissioner would say, that is my mark? My proposal would be, and it's a little bit different, we have to change the deal in our knowledge of the orbital environment. We're not where we should be in Europe. We absolutely have to increase this because we are relying so much on space in Europe. Rodrigo, as you said so well, in the, um, for security reasons, for you know, uh, the, the, the ground truth of the regional application, for everything. We are not where we should be in Europe. We have to have the ability to know exactly what's going on up there for our own purposes and to make sure we're well positioned then to negotiate internationally and to influence these negotiations. And it starts with European capabilities in space surveillance and tracking at the next level. And I mean, at truly at the next level. So that's what I would propose to the commissioner. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much for um, you know, uh, stepping up to the challenge uh, of this very important uh, conversation. Thank you for being such an engaged and active audience, because actually these debates would be meaningless if you weren't here and, and if you weren't engaged. So thank you also. I've eaten into your coffee break. I do apologize. Um, we were meant to have a half an hour, but we've got less than that. I've got about 20 minutes. Don't go away. Don't run away, because actually, it's interesting that we start, we, we ended on the debate around security, if you like. We move into a session which is talking about human security and how do you use data and uh, the notion of AI to generate a better response to climate um, uh, climate change and uh, inform climate policy. So thank our pa pa panelists in the usual manner. Thank you very much. You've been lovely. And thank you. Um, go and have a nice cup of coffee, or you can go outside as well in the terrace, but be back at quarter two. Thank you very much.
Test 1, 2. Test 1, 2. Test 1, 2, 3. Test 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Test 1, 2. Test 1, 2. Ok. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 
Hello, everybody. Please take your seats. Everyone back in? Yes, I believe so. Um, so that was a you know a very interesting, uh, a deep dive into um, values and the role of agencies and the need to be, be better coordination, better coherence, um, and looking to the future. It was good to get people's priorities um, for a new commission. We now now turn our attention to human security and think about the power, the role, uh, and the uh, potential of data and AI on uh, addressing climate policy, but supporting climate policy, but cl supporting climate action as well. So um, it's a timely debate, obviously. Um, uh, and they couldn't, you know, we know what's happening to our planet uh, in various ways. And we know that we need to be uh, much more urgent, bold, um, and agile in how we tackle this increasingly unpredictable uh, world that we are living in. And, you know, we just know every year we get the, uh, the data, don't we, from the IPCC or others who say, you know, the Earth is warmer than it's ever been. Um, it's now getting really bad and it's getting really bad. And you get the message every year, but you somehow think, actually, when do politicians really um, uh, move the needle and the dial, if you like, on much more bold... Um, and speedier action in terms of tackling the impact of climate change. So what does space have to offer in that regard? So we have a love, interesting panel that's going to take us on a different journey to the one that we started with in the first panel. I want to start with someone who is very close to the Director General of uh, the European Space Agency, the head of his cabinet, uh, Leah, who's here to uh, speak to us. And thank you for making the time to come across. Um, Leah, can you uh, share with us, from your perspective, um, the, the importance of, you know, on the one hand, artificial intelligence and AI in terms of uh, shaping Europe's uh, you know, policy, but how can space data more broadly in the approach to space enhance Europe's competitiveness in this field in terms of tackling climate policy as well? Thank you, and good morning, everybody. Very pleased to be with you here for the first time, actually. Mm, indeed. <laughs> um, a very challenging topic. Um, so indeed, uh, as, you, as you've introduced, the challenges that are induced by climate change are huge and enormous for, for the humanity. Um, there have been several activities now for many decades, actually, in order to tackle all the issues. <clears throat> and we are now in a situation where... Um, we can at least acknowledge a certain fact and also be able to plan the future, although we still don't have the perfect answer. So Europe is certainly a leader in tackling the so-called green transition. Uh, Europe is a leader in actually recognizing the effects of climate change and the need to go for climate neutrality. Um, we have important legislative packages that are either uh, agreed or under negotiation uh, that uh, are also coupled with very detailed action plans, and this is extremely powerful in how we organize our society, our economy in Europe, and how we interact with international partners in order to tackle uh, climate change. And this vary from different uh, types, from uh, um, uh, following emissions, like I think of the emissions trading system, for example, uh, verification of such uh, emissions up to certification of carbon removals, uh, uh, or even how we uh, control emissions in the different sectors, I think of, of road transport, industry, and so on. Uh, it's not the purpose to actually list, list all of these. So there is a, a big uh, ambition in terms of policy uh, in order to change things in Europe. We are also very conscious that we, are, we will never manage it alone. We need the international partners to play the game, of course, and there is a huge debate about it. So we have policy, we have legislation, and we also have many EU programs, actually, that support, um, that support these ambitions, uh, Innovation Fund, Climate Adaptation Fund, and so on. So 
this is the green transition from the EU side, the new green deal. On the other hand, the digital transition, of course, is extremely prominent also from the EU side um, with several evolutions. Uh, most recently, I mean, you, you want to refer specifically on the AI Act. Uh, however, also in other, um, in other areas, um, there is, a big, uh, there is a big evolution that allows actually managing different parts of the economy. And the key for the future is a deeper integration between green and digital when it comes to climate change. Why? Because climate change is complex. If we want to understand, we need global trends, we need local trends, we need what-if scenario and so on. Uh, we need to be able to uh, uh, adapt as a citizen, as, a, as industry, as a company, as a region and so on. So it's very complex. So the only way actually to handle this complexity is to, be, to help ourselves with uh, automated tools. So this is the first message. Now, the second message, of course, space is extremely relevant. Uh, tackling climate change means understanding our planet and how we interact with it. And through space, we are proud, this was mentioned, of having uh, the, an excelling Earth observation system, uh, Copernicus, um, which allows observing all Earth subsystems and the interactions. It allows us producing a flow of data, overwhelming flow of data on the state of our planet and actually modeling and forecasting. We are able to have different observations to follow climate variables, to contribute to international efforts for the IPCC and so on. So space is highly relevant. Um, for uh, monitoring climate change. And space is enabled by the digital, and it's also, it's also a supplier of the digital, by the way, I think of connectivity. It is enabled of the digital, just to use one example, uh, Destination Earth Digital Twins, uh, allowing to actually model parts of our planet or even have the ambition, I'm not sure to which extent we will ever manage to do this, have the ambition to actually model the, our planet and the interaction with these different systems uh, is also, let's say, an important, an important tool. Why? Because, as I said before, it's all about understanding where we're heading at. What if we did that simulation? We need the digital twin. We need high processing facilities and so on. So the digital and AI are certainly a huge enabler. Um, on the ESA side, as I mentioned uh, before, we, have, uh, we are proud of important uh, developments. I mean, Frederick listed them earlier on, Copernicus science missions. We have important climate, sciences, climate science activities. Um, uh, we have uh, scientific missions uh, that actually are not so well known necessarily. However, they all provide uh, a, a very important uh, data. Uh, we are also proud of the tools that ESA is putting in place to actually address the technical dimension, the technical complexity. Um, uh, for example, many series of uh, services and trying to understand how to, uh, let's say, handle the user, I think, of the climate change uh, initiative, I think, of uh, service elements and so on, many different ways and many different tools to actually get closer to the citizen. And most recently, the most important tool is called Accelerator, so the Green for Space Accelerate, the Space for Green Accelerator, also addressing um, the the uh, crisis they mentioned through rap rapid resilience and response. So many tools in place. Now, maybe one last me message on my side, and then uh, we'll continue the discussion afterwards. Um, um, the, the recent initiative uh, from uh, the Commission on AI Act and all the debate in the EU about AI Act is extremely important because as we go deeper into the green and the integration with the digital, the different transitions, the more we will go towards verification, certification, and it will be about companies, it could even be about people. So it's very important that we protect our interests. It's very important that we have the data so that we can create value, that we can uh, create business, we can be fast in, in exploiting different solutions, but there is the other side of the coin, which is protection, da personal data protection, liability, and so on. And therefore, it is extremely relevant to come with, uh, with an initiative that actually tried, tries to put this into a frame uh, and, and, and protect the citizens, ultimately, and also set an international standards and set the tone as we did with GDPR. So I think there is great potential there um, as we head across the future, especially when it comes to human security and any uh, liabilities around it. Leah, thank you very much here. for that broad 
sweep, but also then focusing on the kind of key areas where, you know, you quite rightly say, um, Europe led the way in terms of GDPR, which is an unfortunate acro you know, acronym, unfor you know, it's, it's pity because it really doesn't say what it says on the tin, uh, what it means. But uh, there we are. But there are opportunities. Let's come back to that. It would be really good to understand from an ESA point of view is that what's the kind of the leading edge that we need to be able to develop in the next five years, let's say, that combines human secu security of data, protection of people and regions and environments, whilst also enabling us to tackle climate, uh, the impact of climate uh, change, and then also be competitive. It's a very kind of interesting nexus that we need to be thinking about. Somehow, most times, institutions don't think like that. They are compartmentalized. They do not come, come together in that more coherent way. But let's see. Thank you for that. Clemence, thank you for joining. I'm going to turn to our, our colleague on, online, on screen. Thank you for joining us virtually. Um, I hope you can hear me. You can hear me? Great. Excellent. Yes. You're from the European Space Policy Institute. So, Clemence, you, um, you know, you've done a lot of research. You have, you know, the Institute focuses much on actually what we need to learn and what we need to explore further in terms of, um, uh, you know, space data. From your experience at the Institute, what are the hurdles currently that you're facing to, which are not enabling the, ex, it's a terrible thing to say, exploiting um, the uh, space data to its full? What are the hurdles? Yeah, so um, as part of a yearly project, we analyze. Um, One second, Clemence, we're well, having just a bit. Clemence, can I just pause you? Can our technical people deal with this, please? Is that this, we're just, is the connection okay? Yeah? Okay, let's try again, Clemence. Does that work? Yeah, great. Um, okay, so uh, as part of the um, long year project, um, analyze the risks um, in climate policies, and, uh, we try to identify how space was in uh, your and uh, what were some um, points to uh, the use of space in the climate policy making process? And yeah, uh, Clemens, I'm going to have to pause you again because this is uh, for the audience. We can't hear you clearly. You keep on cutting out and you kind of like, a, um, I don't know whether it's the connection issue at your end or our end. Is it an issue at our end? Can someone? No, it's not. It's her end. You, so I've been told this. I don't know what that means, but... This is a technical language, obviously. It says something about connection, <laughs> I think. So could you do either, I don't know, let's try again for third time. Because it's really difficult to, because you have such wonderful things to say, but we can't hear you properly. Very sorry. I, I also hear mm. in the back, so I hear the speakers. Perhaps move away further from the mic. No, okay. Maybe you can move on and we'll try to move to Yeah, let's, let's see. I'll let my colleagues speak to you and then see what the problem is and bring you back in a moment. Um, so, but it's a pity because uh, it would have been a nice segue into our third speaker. That's poorly. But uh, let's, let's see if we can bring you back in more uh, an effective uh, way uh, in a moment or two. And whilst we do that, uh, Clemence, I'm going to turn to Pauline. Um, Pauline, thank you for joining us. And people were wondering why we've got the International Red Cross here. And it's great that you are here, because it's important that um, we see the full scope. And what we're trying to do here in this summit is to demonstrate uh, how space matters to whole of society, whole of economy. And, uh, you know, in terms of what you do, in terms of human security and, and saving lives and protecting lives, um, it's, in, it's important that you're here to, I suppose, um, set out what your concerns are, you know, in terms of space data for, uh, you know, a humanitarian organisation like yourself. But what is that, you know, what, what, what are the practical applications that you need and what needs to improve to enable you to do your job better um, as an agency. So what can, you know, what can some of the agencies do in terms of space um, and, and harnessing data and AI to help you um, achieve your purpose and function? Thank you for being here, Pauline. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for having the ICRC here. We really appreciate this opportunity to speak about the topic that is really growing in importance uh, for us. 
So as you know, the ICRC, or you may know the ICRC, is a humanitarian organization with an exclusive mandate to uh, support and to protect the life and dignity of persons in situation of armed conflict and other situations of violence, but also to provide them with assistance. And the other part of our mandate is to enhance the respect for international humanitarian law. That is the law that is applicable in situation of armed conflict. And as a humanitarian uh, organization working in situations of armed conflict, we witnessed firsthand um, the, the very and very accurately the combined, but also the cumulative impact that climate change can have on the people uh, that uh, we, we are supporting and we are helping in those uh, situations. And in a report that we have uh, published that is called When Rain Turns to Dust, we see that people entering conflict are not only amongst the most vulnerable to climate change, but also that are um, those most neglected by climate action. Uh, and part of that is because there is a challenge in accessing those peoples because of the such situations. Um, and so we are calling for this trend to uh, change and we are working ourselves to make this uh, in our humanitarian answer to face uh, this challenge. And in this framework, that's why I'm so happy to be here today, in this framework space is really instrumental in our daily work. And for instance, um, this is one of the examples, we are using phone satellites to help uh, building links between re uh, building links between the families that have been separated by uh, armed conflict or other situations. And so the need to be able to rely to satellites is very important, but it's also very important for image satel um, satellite imagery. It's fundamental for the work because of this is uh, all about where, when you want to provide humanitarian uh, aid to the people and visualizes, visualization sorry, really helps us to understand first the situation and then to be able to react so in the decision uh, making process. And so at the ICRC, what we do is that we have built the capacity there with colleagues that are working in the field, but also in the, in the HQ, in the geographic information system that we have created. And we have this geodata analytic team that is present and in 50, uh, with 50 colleagues and covering uh, 75 uh, different countries. And what we do is that we collect, of course, the data, we analyze the data, but also we merge those data with everything that is uh, available uh, open source including, of course, the data of the uh, ESA, but also we can merge them with other uh, data systems that are available, for instance, the Family uh, Early Warning System Network, um, and also the, the armed conflict locations and even data projects that help us to, path, to, to build the different uh, images that we will extract and also to analyze the situation and use those images in the way that we will um, that we will uh, build our answer to the situations of emergencies. And therefore, the work that ISA is conducting in providing those images, but not only the images, but also the index that we will be able to use, the burn index, the water index, the vegetation uh, index, is really important for us. So if I have to come to some uh, examples of what we do and where we work and how we concretely use those data, I could take many of them, uh, especially important for areas where we do not have access. And so basically being able to assess the situation uh, from the space is really important for us. And so um, in this area, what we do, for instance, is rooftop counting. Because if you can assess how many roofs you have, you can try to build an image, a clear image of how many people you may have in an area and therefore target and calibrate the, the assistance that you will uh, provide in this area. It's also helping, for instance, in the framework of uh, population displacement, so IDPs. If you know how many people are displaced, you know who you can help. It helps when we want to build the water and sanitation system in an area to know what is where on this area and where we have to implement uh, the, the water and sanitation um, systems there. And if I have to 
dive into one of the examples that really fits into uh, the, the topic today. This will be uh, how AI enables a more effective humanitarian action and the project that we have launched uh, with uh, the Ecole Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne and the ETH Zurich, together also with the Bin Khalifa University in Qatar. And we have um, an intelligence-based program that is called POMELO, and POMELO um, help us to assess the density of population in an area. Because most of the time when we are intervening in some places, we do not know how many people there are. If there is a census that has been done, it is either not accurate or too dated. So we want to be able to see correctly or to assess correctly or to forecast correctly how many people will be present in an area. And so this program that we had launched has been then used uh, very successfully and tested very successfully in, um, in the different African countries with very uh, disaggregated data. And so we go into very the granularity of the situation there and we can therefore better help um, providing the answer to the situation. If you are a technician and you want to read more about uh, the modus operandi and the methods it has been published in uh, Nature, um, so I invite you to read about, uh, about that. And so basically those were very practical areas where uh, we, are, we are intervening as a humanitarian actor, but also where we are using satellite data and AI because of, there is such a huge amount of data that without the AI would not be able to, um, to assess the situation. And one of the examples is that through the AI, we are not obliged to have a human behind the screen um, watching everything, but we can have a system that alerts us when there is an anormality. For example, when you have um, when you have uh, the uh, new crops, or when you have a new agriculture that is uh, coming, while before you didn't. It means that population has moved from an area to the other. Or when you do not have agriculture where you used to have it, where you had some uh, some life, and then the people have been forced to move because of the armed conflict uh, or other. Um, so at the moment, this is what we see as a report of using uh, AI in the in satellite uh, data analysis, and also um, the the opportunity for us to. Um, access uh, as many open data as possible and to process them to extract some information. But you were also speaking about the concerns mm -hmm. that we have. Yeah. And so basically the concerns that we have is really accessing the data. And so accessing the data, there is data that is open source. Sometimes we would need for some of our activities that are, that are much more precise than the data that are open source. And so they are to be both and they are a kind of a, um, um, expensive for a humanitarian organization as uh, the ICRC. There is also for us the issue of perception. So when you are a humanitarian organization and that you are intervening in situations of armed conflict, if you collect data and image satel uh, satellite imagery, in particular if those data are covering the patterns of harm, and the violence in uh, some situations, and we have uh, a new uh, a new activity on this. So we have built um, a new program to harnessing uh, the data to try to cover the patterns of violence and be able to react to that. If you are doing that, you are seen as an actor that is collecting data, for instance, about the combatants or the non-state armed groups that are present in an area. And so therefore, you need to invest more into the trust building between those groups to make them understand that this is only for your own security reasons or the security of the persons that you are taking care of, that you are assisting. And so basically, that this is not for any military purpose or that they will not be shared with military actors or combatants that are present uh, in the field. So all those are the, the concerns that we have. But one of the biggest concerns that we have now is the accessibility in terms of will we be able to use those satellites and those data uh, in the future because of you spoke uh, in the previous panel about the debris and the fact that the ESA is going for zero debris in 2030. But there are also the debris that would be created by military activities in outer space. 
And therefore, if you lose this access to the other space data, you lose everything that I explained about and how we can better target. And therefore, we are calling from some recommend, we have made some recommendations, but we are also calling for states to acknowledge the fact that international humanitarian law, so the law of armed conflict, applies in outer space, and that therefore, any activity, military activity, that would be conducted in the framework of an armed conflict should respect international humanitarian law, including the fact that those systems are dual use, and so basically they could be targeted in some circumstances as military uh, objectives under the law of armed conflict, which would create data, so uh, which would create sorry uh, debris. So basically, there is the need to refrain from using, if possible, in the circumstances, uh, to use in kinetic means that would create such debris if you want to neutralize them. And those are all the recommendations that we made to both respect IHL and also try to protect the access to those data that are really fun fundamental for humanitarian organization, but for everyone, as we discussed already today. Sure, um, and this is, I mean, for many, I'm sure in the audience, we, you know, probably aren't aware about the impact uh, of space data and the kind of examples that you've just given in terms of humanitarian effort, human security. Um, and, you know, in, in this program of Making Space Matter, we've, we've had many discussions about the, uh, the absence of international um, governance of space. I mean, a lot of the uh, treaties, etc., are mostly out of date, and actually, no one's the, the international police person. Uh, no one's actually monitoring really in a real sense. Most of it's elective. Member states are putting stuff up, but they, you know, you've got the UN agency they have to report into, uh, but you don't really have a sense of a proper governance structure. So, <coughs> what you're saying about international humanitarian law feels as if like that's just in a different realm. Are you actually getting access to understanding what that means by international bodies? So you're saying that it's important, that, and you're quite right, that international humanitarian law is, um, is seen as being important in the international sphere. But who are you talking to? Because, who, who, you know, is that, which is it, the UN agencies? Who is it that you think should be responsible for what you're talking about? Where's the, you know, where should be the international framework? Who is the owner of the international framework? States. States. We are talking to states. And international bodies do not exist if states do not create them. So basically, states have the responsibility to uphold international law. And you know what's the beauty of international humanitarian law? Is that it's um, universally recognized. So the Geneva Conventions have been ratified by all the states in the world. And they have in those conventions said that they would not only respect international humanitarian law, but also ensure respect for international humanitarian law. And so basically, although international humanitarian law only applies in situations of armed conflict, those situations are, and we see that nowadays, those situations are those that are creating huge risks for humans, of course, but also for the assets that are enabling the life of humans. And so basically, according to those principles of international humanitarian law that everyone agrees upon, there should be at least a reflection and then an implementation of the outcome of this reflection about how to better protect those assets that are, and we all recognize this here, vital for us and for life on Earth, but also that can create huge risk, and I'm speaking here about physical risk mm. for uh, the, the human being on Earth. Thank you. Sure. No, no, I, and, and this is not an answer question for you, uh, Pauline, but the reality is I can think of at least 10 world leaders who are varying on the extreme or dictatorial who wouldn't give a damn about what you're talking about and so, or about international human law. And so, you, you know, um, to bring this down to, you know, to earth, if you like, into the real terms, um, I'm not sure, you know, which is the institution that will have the power to really... Um, help vouchsafe our human security. But before you come back, I know that um, uh, Leah wants to come in on this. A, a very brief uh, comment, because I, I know there are many points to discuss. Um, so here I would like, when it comes to space assets, I would like to make the distinction between continuity of the flow of data and therefore the infrastructures, the succession, the improvements, the upgrades and so on, and protection of the space assets. These are two completely different debates. Okay. When it comes to protection, I think we are currently faced with an unprecedented exponential increase of space assets in orbits, in different orbits, by the way. When the UN conventions were uh, set up, we 
couldn't have imagined this exponential increase necessarily. Maybe some have imagined it, but in general, they have not been made actually for this kind of intensive use. There is a huge change with mega constellations, for example. Like we speak about thousands of satellites that uh, uh, go into orbits uh, with uh, daily or weekly launches and so on, uh, without naming specific missions. And so, what is happening now is that we really have to invent how we want to approach space traffic management, space debris, and so on. It's a huge challenge. Nobody has the perfect answer, yeah. and certainly requires international cooperation. And it's definitely also an important debate, both in the ESA context and in the EU context, as you know, with successive discussions. Uh, uh, there was a commission communication, council discussions, parliament, different entities, and so on. And I stop here, but I think my main message is, yes, we need to tackle it, and we need to invent the way, basically. Okay. Let me get a reaction from the audience um, before I bring you back. And I want to try and see if I can get Clemence in again, but I'll, I'll, I'll be a bit, because um, you've been freezing a lot. And I'm not sure that, actually, I mean, I mean freezing in the screen um, a lot, Clemence says. I want to make sure that we have got it right before I bring you back in. But we already have a comment. So a mic over here to the middle of the room, please, the gentleman with the glasses. Please do introduce yourself and what the comment or question is. Yes. Sorry, from... Uh, uh, Foundation for Future Generation Fund uh, about uh, space and sustainability. Um, I, I just, uh, I think uh, space activities have a side effect uh, as far as climate change is concerned. Uh, those huge launch of um, uh, um, uh, rockets, yes. um, they perturbate the upper atmosphere and they use a lot of energy. Uh, data managing is uh, also using a lot of energy. ESA is the only one uh, that is tackling the problem seriously. They, for example, uh, study uh, the possibility to have data center in the outer space so that the energy is, uh, uh, is, is, is directly coming from uh, the sun without uh, uh, making too much of a problem on, on, the, on the ground. But this is, has to be also, uh, it, it's very important that Europe tries to uh, make um, uh, norms as far as the uh, impact on the atmosphere uh, of the uh, space activity is concerned. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise we are not on a, on a level playing field. Indeed. I mean, you're right to say that ESA is doing uh, a number of things, but, you know, they, they, ESA needs to be better at promoting the kind of gems it has. So the Solaris Initiative, for example, you know, what you have, the potential of Solaris to generate, you know, energy from up there is phenomenal. But, you know, uh, I'm not sure how widely known it is or where, what the state of readiness it is to be, you know, uh, put out there. But it's a huge solution to a, certain, to a major problem of the, our energy crisis, but using space in a different way. Can I ask you, sir... Who do you think should be the lawmaker? Because you, no, no, it's important because some of us we talk about this, right? And we say we need to set norms, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I keep on wondering that you know, as the pace of change accelerates, rogue actors from the private sector are going into space at a at a pace that we cannot imagine. And yet you've got politicians thinking, thinking about saying, oh, I don't really know, and focusing on something else. Is that, who should be the lawmaker from your perspective? I think there is always, uh, already a space uh, ambassador of the uh, European uh, Union, and I think it, it should be at the level of uh, the United Nations. Okay. Anybody else? Who else? Let me just take the reactions from... Please, uh, introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Kostas Tervenis from Entersoft. We're an IT company that provides services to the, the EU. Mm. Uh, I have a very simple question. The... When we're talking about satellite data, essentially we're talking about surveillance. It's a, it's a forbidden word, but that's what it is. And we understand the, uh, the limitations and, and, and the freedoms, let's say, we have uh, in the EU with GDPR. We have the upcoming AI regulation, which is uh, now coming into force and so forth and so on. In order for AI to be effective uh, as far as having an effect on climate change, on climate policy, and so forth. We have to use the forbidden word again, predictive analytics. 
how are we getting ahead of that? Just explain that for the rest of you. Okay, so it's, it's easy to look at something that's happening now and doing an analysis, and there are no legal rat ratifications for that. But predictive analytics can look into the future. And there have been stories written about it, Minority Report, and so forth and so on. So my question is, as I am in the, this business, yeah. what is the regulatory framework in the EU doing to deal with this? How are we moving along these lines? I mean, it can be an effective tool in combating these rogue actors, and, and not only people going up into space, but factories producing an excess of uh, you know, carbon emissions and, and, and being able to uh, you know, predict that they will be worse in the future and so forth and so on. So uh, it's a very touchy subject, and I'm interested to hear what the panel will say about it. And so can I ask you the same question? Who should be the lawmaker <laughs> or the guardian? Uh, it's an important thing to address, isn't it? I, I, it it's a very important thing. Uh, in, in these panels, uh, I have often conflicted with, with friends of Europe as far as the regulatory uh, aspects of I think that states should be the guardians, and, and I'm a, a European federalist, so I'll take it even one step further. But, uh, you know, having the, the certain age and, and understanding that passing that is, is, is another thing entirely, uh, I think that the states should be the, the guardian. Yes. Okay. Gentlemen there at the back as well. Please don't, you know, I think this is a good poll because actually we need to know. Because on the one hand, you've got the UN. The other is a more individual. It's a, at the member state level. My only challenge to both of you is the UN hasn't been able to actually, um, uh, compl you know, ensure compliance for TOFI, actually, historically since it's, it's set up. Member states go their own way. So you're going to have a, a thousand flowers bloom approach, which is not going to protect international security. Uh, but I know, you know, that we can have differences there. Yes. Gentlemen there, please, yes. what's your view? Uh, I own all to contribute to the knowledge because we have five treaties in the United Nations. It's you need to hold it up and speak uh, a little bit clearer uh, they, so we can understand. There is a, a, a United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Users of Outer Space. Mm -hmm. We have five treaties mm -hmm. already, mm -hmm. which under, uh, underpin the, the, the space law. So uh, the European Union can assist by, uh, how could we say, forcing this committee to act uh, because we have really problems from the USA, apart from the private sector, there are a lot of problems over there. Thank you very much. Okay, let's go back to it. Unless you want to, ah, great, come in, please. At the front here. Again, do introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Christina from University of Amsterdam. So my question would be more legally. Is space law property law? Who is then the owner? And going back to the question, who's the lawmaker? If member states send satellites, is it then from Italy? Is it from the EU? Who shares ownership of this data surveillances? Excellent question. Thank you very much. Um, uh, uh, one more at the end, just there. And I want to draw your attention. I haven't, I've been really miserable in uh, introducing our, our illustrator, Mena, who's doing wonderful stuff that she's generating those images, which are a reflection of some of our debate, just, that you're, well, just in case you're wondering. Sir, please. Thank you, Dramanda. I'm Mr. Baruti, involved in peace building and conflict prevention. Uh, just to comment on the presentation of Madame Pauline on the contribution of states of uh, the hazardous situation armed conflict, I want only to add that now, Currently, is not only states who are responsible responsible for uh, the space control, because some armed group, uh, armed uh, insurgency group, have now their own uh, technical or specialist or spare in space. They come from either the retired uh, retired uh, uh, civil civil servant or People who are under, uh, who are not financially good paid, and sell the services uh, to insurgency group. So, the, we should take into consideration this uh, uncontrolled uh, group of uh, experts who know very well how mm -hmm. the space is working, but working outside for the insurgency group and the army group to, uh, okay. to control the uh, situation. So uh, I wanted to give that uh, clarification because in 
foreign state, uh, Islamic, Islamic uh, state uh, army, or in the uh, uh, Middle East, there is a group of experts who are making drone, making many things uh, uh, which are not control of the official uh, authorities. Indeed, uh, indeed. Thank you very much. Um, and also, I hope some of the, you know, your questions have been excellent, actually. And we have our resident rapporteur, Emily, at the back there, who's hopefully capturing the waving there. But with, I hope we've captured some of those good questions. I really want us to kind of come back on that, because that, you know, that very last that question, you know, cuts at the heart of it, in the sense that, you know, uh, a year ago, or a couple, two years ago, when we had one of these conversations about who governs space, we had the UN agency. And ultimately, it's it's toothless in the sense that what they do is they're bureaucrats, right? You know, they count on, you know, member states saying, and nothing against you if you're watching online either. I didn't mean that in a horrible way. UN, we love you. Um, is that, um, is that um, you know, what we heard is entirely elective. So, and, you know, they only have information which they have given to them, uh, ultimately. Uh, but, you know, there you are. Um, I'll come back to you in a moment, if I may, but I think we've got the... Uh, the Pauline and uh, the Clemence, Clemence situation under control. Clemence, can you hear me? Oh dear. Hear you. You're looking bewildered. Can you hear me? I, I can hear you, yes. Excellent. We've got just got an unfortunate kind of lap, gap lap of time, but that shouldn't be a problem as long as we can hear you. So going back to you, Clemence, very quickly, tell us what do you think are the biggest hurdles? Um, for uh, exploiting uh, space data uh, for policymakers, especially in the context of climate policy. Okay, so I'll be quick, as quick as possible before the connection drops. Um, so we conducted a study with ESA on the role of space in uh, European climate policies, and we identified some blocking points for why space was in a limited way or what could prevent policy and the first reason was that policymaking and scientific communities rarely interact so uh, policymaking and scientific communities uh, generally do not inter Yeah, this is not fun, is People it? People involved apologize. in the policymaking process, and most of them considered that they were too far removed from the scientific process, that most of them considered um, that uh, scientists were not really presenting their research findings, that they perceived the divide between science and policy, and that uh, when scientists presented their research to them, um, it was in technical language and too complicated for them to, to truly understand because most policymakers have backgrounds in social sciences in Europe rather than engineering or hard science. The second reason was that policymakers require actionable information and do not use raw data. So that's where the AI comes in. And policymakers usually refer to reports or academic papers that do not only use space-based data, but also provide an analysis and uh, policy recommendations already. So they don't fundamentally care that the data comes from a satellite. They just want the analytics and the solution, the actionable information to solve their problem. The third reason is that references to space depend highly on the people involved in the policymaking process and at what point. So if you look at the um, uh, climate policy governance and how space um, is placed into that in ESA member states, what we found is that the countries in which scientists are involved throughout the entire process have higher numbers of references to space than countries where, for instance, scientists are only involved at the end. Um, another reason is that uh, the scientific community that um, is playing a role in the elaboration of climate policies and calling for the inclusion of space-based data is relatively small. So what we did is that we look at the climate policies in all ESA member states from the early 2000s to 2020, and um, we looked also into the references, so the sources of the policy documents, and the sources of the sources of the documents, so a bit in this Russian doll kind of uh, methodology. 
And it's always the same authors that are referenced repeatedly in all policy documents. So the, the space community is very small. Uh, so there's a small number of people that actually truly advocate for integrating space-based data in, in climate policies. And the final reason blocking points that we find is that references to space are more present in all the policy documents. So when we looked at those more than 500 policy documents for, for a period of 20 years, um, we found that older policies uh, included more measures related to space for climate monitoring, probably because the systems were not in place at the time. So later policies do not necessarily provide updates on the systems or further elaborate on the resolution, time scale, whether in implementations of, of those systems. Um, a second hypothesis was that um, international and European climate data are now easy, easily accessible and abundant. Um, so the knowledge gap is not as obvious as 20 years ago. So um, space is not necessarily as explicitly mentioned in climate policies. Um, it's a bit taken for granted. Um, also, uh, one hypothesis is that sp space policies have proliferated in the past 20 years. Um, and measures related to the improvement of space-based climate data or uh, monitoring systems might be outlined in space policies now rather than climate policies. And finally, um, in uh, information-dense, image-driven society, we saw that climate policies and climate policy documents may not be directed to the same target reader um, as it used to. So policy documents are now a bit designed for wider public consumption with strong improvement on the shape, the design, they look a bit like marketing, uh, graphic design documents so that they can be read by all citizens. So there's less re academic references, less uh, footnotes, less uh, bibliography. Um, so it's much harder to check whether space is referenced and how. So it doesn't mean that space is not used. It's, it is used in the policymaking process, but it's just not necessarily uh, referenced explicitly because it's a bit taken for, for granted okay. by policymakers now. Great, thank you. Um, um, thank you for sticking with us. And, and you know, I, I'm sorry about the technical difficulties because that's really hampered uh, the kind of us, the, our quality of our hearing uh, in terms of what you're what you have. But you know, you made some fine points uh, which uh, have been captured uh, for the sake of the, you know the discussion. Um, I want to go back to some of the issues that have been raised. But before I turn to Vitsa, uh, uh, our final speaker will bring a very different angle into this discussion and bring it really back down to what to do with citizens. But I wanted to check if there are any further questions people had in their mind and whether you want to come back in now or later. Leah, are you happy to come? You can come a bit later. Is that okay with you? Brilliant. Okay, let's do that. Any kind of questions at all from anyone else in terms of what you've heard so far? Okay, because I know there are quite a few you know, interesting uh, questions that were posed already. So, Wits, I'm going to come back to you. Um, and then, you know, I give even the colleagues that I'm present, not even on the panel, but someone in the, in the room from Space Agency, to answer some of the questions that we've, that we've heard from people about, you know, ownership and the law and regulation. Witsit, you are one of our European Young Leaders. So he is, um, we have a programme called European Young Leaders where we recruit uh, 40, uh, every year 40 under 40 year olds who've done significant things in their lives from across Europe. And uh, Witsit is one of those. He, he's the founder. Uh, um, uh, and, you know, current CEO of something called uh, Sea Rangers, which has done some amazing things. Uh, but he has an idea and an approach that I suppose combines everything we've been talking about in the sense of um, capacity of space to generate data and information, doing something with, you know, young people in particular in terms of accessing their engagement uh, with space, and then also addressing climate change. With that, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Demendra. And I realize I'm the only one standing between you and your lunch, so <laughs> we'll keep it nice and brief. Um, yeah, I'm sort of taken by the fact that quite a few of the previous speakers uh, addressed this utilizing space data for citizens, uh, talking about the awareness and needing to really grow the public backing. Um, and also, in a sense, really, like many other sectors, struggling perhaps to really get broader political backing for long-term vision to really fund and implement um, you know, the programs we, we, we think society can benefit from. 
Um, and what also struck me, Roy, when you mentioned that, you know, speaking with mayors and talking to regions, people are like, well, you know, what's this going to do for us? And what we essentially see is that there is a real parallel with the uh, biodiversity restoration field. So I actually have worked in ocean conservation for many, many years, um, and we found the same sort of challenges. There's a lack of political sort of vision to really take it long term. There's really a need to build capacity to involve a younger generation. And we essentially devised um, a way to sort of bring in a very different element. And, and I'll explain this through the example of seagrass restoration. So uh, the Green New Deal and the nature restoration laws now proposed really are about large scale restoration of nature. And we're in a scenario where the scientists have managed to develop these really successful methodologies to restore nature. And the moment we're looking at implementation, they need capacity, they need funding, they need political backing. Um, and it's very difficult as a scientific institution to, to attain that. So we started working in coastal communities with young unemployed people and essentially training them as what we call sea rangers, which is an entry level education into a maritime career. And while we train them for one year and employ them, they actively built the capacity to assist governments with, with restoration. And what was amazing to see is that because it creates employment, because it, it makes a difference to the lives of young people, suddenly there would be social impact financing coming in. Suddenly the Navy said, hey, after they've been trained as maritime people, uh, we actually want to recruit them. So suddenly the Navy in the Netherlands would make resources available for us to train. Sea Rangers and politicians would say, oh, hold on, you're creating employment in areas where the youth unemployment rates are very high. So I think what we realized as some of our assignments with the Sea Rangers also include satellite data is that there is a parallel and perhaps a real power to take those lessons learned in that biodiversity restoration space and apply them in the space field. And how do we essentially Yes, it's about building capacity. It's also about translating how the data is used on the ground. So the idea of a space ranger program where we train young people at a very entry level to assist in analyzing data and really building those user cases. Um, and one thing that also strikes me is that like, there's real strength in diversity. And I think if you currently want to go into the space field, you need a master's or a PhD. Like, uh, there aren't really any other, you know, there's not a blue collar workforce <laughs> right to apply space data and but there should be because i think the broader the more diverse uh, the group of young people we can involve also the more impact mayors and and local and regional politicians will see on the ground so um you know there is also perhaps that sense of how do young people get a not just a sense but a real ownership over this issue and i think just like the sea rangers having a role like a space ranger and feeling like you're doing something with purpose and you're employed in this field and you are trained to then go and work with other startups and companies and like that kind of sort of momentum i think yeah it's something we really we really need to build so i think we're very much looking forward to you know even though we're just sort of new in this field building relationships uh, with isa and other some some potentially uh, prominent uh, you know what could be partners uh, in this field to really i think i would say raise the social value mm -hmm. in the space sector um, yeah, and ensure that that youth employment and skills piece, um, that we make it uh, as concrete as possible. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad, you know, you, you were able to make the time to join us because you bring in a different dimension to the conversation so far. And it also um, demonstrates the importance of entrepreneurs like you with social purpose, engaging in an area that people, most people don't see as being relevant. It's, and that's, you, that's what you're doing. In terms of, I love your idea of space rangers, and let's hope you can give it birth soon. Um, and um, you know, there are people here in the audience who can, like, you know, we've got some private sector, we've got the private sector association here. I'm sorry, I'm looking at you right, you caught my eye. You're thinking, oh, bugger. I can see that you're looking at your eyes saying, please look away, but I'm not going to. I want to bring you in, in terms of just building on what's being said about um, uh, from Vitsa, but broadly, you know, in terms of we've constantly hear about the public agencies, could you give us your reflection on uh, the role the private sector is playing now or could play better if other conditions were being met? So, i.e., what's you know, what kinds of roles would you like to play, and uh, is there is there something that public sector needs to do to enable that better? Sorry, but hey, you're here. Yeah, it's really interesting. Do introduce yourself, sorry, yes. I know you, but people may not. 
Yes, my name is Emmanuel Pajot. I am the Secretary General of the European Association of Remote Sensing Company, ERSC Trade Association, representing um, companies involved in the downstream part of Earth observation, so delivering services. Um, that's uh, a really interesting question, because I think that currently we already know that uh, the private sector is uh, delivering a lot of different services, are delivering well, because this market increase. But we could do much more better. We could do much more better if we could uh, understand more the different needs and challenges that the private and public bodies have and they need to tackle. Um, just an example, PCP. Uh, these are kind of tools that would be much more uh, useful for all the different entities I have in mind on top, uh, small and medium companies, because um, thanks to this kind of approaches, they could better um, partner in order to customize solution which will fit the need of uh, these public entities. So it's one of the drivers, I think, to uh, better serve uh, the human goods uh, at the end. But um, this is one. Um, I think the complementarity of the solution is a second topic. Um, we need to have um, publicly owned uh, assets in order to uh, have the core of solution. But then we need to benefit of all the innovation that the private sector can bring in order to complement this need and better uh, allocate uh, resources and, uh, and deliver product or, or services. As an example, we mentioned earlier before um, this uh, flood in uh, Emilia Romagna. Yes. 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 Yeah. Sorry. We, we mentioned this flood in Emilia Romagna. Mm. We have the Copernicus Emergency Services. Yes. Great. But what the day after the acquisition? Sentinel will not fit for this potentially. So the commercial sector can place a significant role in order to support their production in a really efficient way to support all the entities in the field that will need to have fresh data. So a complementarity is a key. Great, thank you, thank you very much. Um, you know, you point to the very uh, uh, important issue of, you know, we talked about it last night, but also today, it's about the collaborative context that we need to achieve between public and private. And we need to move beyond, you know, the norms that we've established for separation, but actually move to a collaborative model of working, especially in the context of where we find ourselves here. I'm, I'm looking at the time and we're nearly, you know, nearly done and, ah, Great, I will bring you in, but as long as you're okay that I might, might in the pun, eat into your lunch by five minutes. Uh, so, go on, please. Thank you very much. Just a quick comment based. Uh, I'm um, uh, Carolina Muti, I'm senior researcher in security, defense, and space at an Italian think tank, Istituto Fer Internazionali. Just a quick comment based on the last two interventions by Vice van der Werf and by uh, Clemens Poirier. Uh, an, an example from Italy. When we uh, talk to space industries uh, in Italy, uh, we, uh, they to tell us that they um, lack. Uh, um, human uh, technical uh, competences, like uh, people uh, with technical competences. Uh, so there is a gap in human uh, resources, in a way. But to bridge um, uh, the space, space with the other sectors, like um, uh, climate change and uh, finance and all the uh, other sectors that will benefit in future from space, um, we also need other skills, project management. Uh, so so I, I was thinking about what uh, Clemens was saying about the fact that sometimes what scientists um, communicate to the decision maker, these are too technical um, um, uh, content and, and uh, too specific for them to understand. So, so my uh, point is we need also to communicate space better uh, in a way, yeah. And, and to bring in people with more various um, skills, not only the technical one and the very uh, high, um, uh, well-skilled one. Yeah, thank you. Well, points very well made. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm going to have to wind this one up now um, because lunch is waiting for you. But also, but before I do, as I said, I'm going to eat five minutes into the time. I want to ask each of you to, um, as I did the previous panel, 
We have elections next year and we have a new college of uh, commissioners uh, that will be appointed. I want you to think about what's that one thing you'd like. So, Clemence, I'm going to start with you first. That, you know, you're, you've been you know, in the field of research, if you like. You, you made the points that you have about uh, the need for um, upgrading, but also the fact that things have changed dramatically uh, as well in the past 20 years. What's the one thing you'd like from a new commission on your subject? So that's very difficult, but I think relating back to what the, the lady just um, from Italy just said, I think it would be to improving user engagement. Um, FP Cup, which was a major part of engaging with users at any level um, in all EU member states, is ending in 2025 and there's no replacement. Um, so I think there should be a way to find um, framework that is a bit less complex that FP Cup to do user engagement so that end users can uh, truly share their needs, um, their requirements, so that then systems are uh, user-friendly and adapted to uh, their problems uh, so that they have actionable information. Okay, great. Thank you very much and thank you for being on the panel. With sir. Yeah, so also referring to the lady from Italy, <laughs> I think um, it, it is a recognition that as we more use space uh, in, a, in, in societal ways, uh, you could say where maybe traditionally it's been more technical and science focused, that does require the space sector to wake up to the fact there's a lot broader need for different skills. So I would say that the focus on youth and youth engagement, which I think Joseph Asbacher, uh, of course, already is very much committed to uh, as a director general, but also this really focus on skills and training, uh, potentially also at a vocational training level and a technical level. Um, so that would be my, uh, my two cents. And you want that done through a kind of um, funding program opportunity or what is, it a pop, you know, what is it you're looking for more specifically, if I can challenge you just to push you back a little bit, what's the specific thing that you could say, okay, want more skills and training, but through a funded program, through a policy measure, what, what is it you'd be looking for? I don't personally believe it's very much to do with policy, uh, partly funding, but not entirely. It's also really the partnerships uh, you build and to see where the need is and, and really be flexible about providing the tailored training to make that fit. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, Turning to yourself, Pauline, uh, what's that one thing? I'm not sure this is for the ICRC to uh, suggest to the Commission what it should do. But, but no, no, this is not a political <laughs> question. I'm, I'm no, asking, of you course. Know. But no, no, just joke aside. No, what, what I would do, uh, nevertheless, is that um, at, at EU level, and this is very much linked about the, the question that you ask several times, who should be the legislator? I think that there is no exclusion on that, and that the EU has a huge power in this, also to be a standard setter, and this is very much linked uh, with what we have seen during the first panel because of the values that the EU has. And I can give you an example where it's uh, very much uh, visible that the EU can really move forward alone, but also with the member states. Um, this is the, the International Conference of the Red Cross. So it's a conference that takes place every four years, bringing together all the national societies, but also the states and the other members of the movement of the Red Cross being the International Federation and the ICRC. And in this audience, the EU is taking pledges uh, alone, but also with the member states. And during the last conference, 2019, the next one will be next year, uh, there was a pledge on the humanitarian impact of climate change, and the EU and the member states have committed to support early warning approach, including projects in order to reduce the humanitarian impact on climate-related disaster based on available forecasts and risk information. And so this is where the EU can work and can advance also its action, even though it would be an international level. The EU is also very much involved to the UN Open-Ended Working Group on Space Trades, where the ICRC is also present and makes recommendation. And so basically, it shouldn't be you know, the, the end point to say we need to move all together or we don't move at all. The EU is really much, can really much empower itself to move forward in this uh, area, and ESA is really instrumental for that. Great. Leah, um, last but not least, perhaps also reflect on some of the questions that were raised, which are more, really very much directed at you know, the ESA. But, you know, um, and then conclude with that. What, what's the one thing that ESA, um, I mean, we've heard from um, your colleagues elsewhere, but what's the one thing you'd want from the Commission? Start with this or finish with this? Finish with. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, okay, let me reflect very briefly on the questions. There was a specific question about who is the owner of satellites mm. and data. Yeah. This is regulated uh, in part by UN conventions or national law, and there are different stages, like when there is a launch of a satellite up to uh, delivery in orbit, and then when the satellite is operated. So this is regulated, and usually the launching state has a responsibility, and then the state that actually operates the satellite has a responsibility. When it comes to European European satellites, there is specific, uh, let's say, there is, there is specific uh, regulatory environment, in particular when it comes to EU programs, for example, uh, which are developed in cooperation with ESA. ESA has certain responsibility to take care and custody up until a certain level. However, the satellites and the data that derive from the satellites are owned by the EU. This is a quite unique uh, environment. Mm. Uh, for example, the Galileo constellation or the Copernicus constellation and so on. This, uh, um, the point on, uh, on, on surveillance and predictive analytics, I will not dwell on this, but I would like to highlight that today, through the space systems, we can observe the Earth's environment in detail, and we're talking about highly scientific observations from air quality, uh, atmospheric composition chemistry, to ocean parameters, inland waters, land, and so on. So it's a lot about the environment, vegetation, which is highly relevant also for security, by the way. And then there are surveillance satellites, uh, for example, national military satellites, or high-resolution imaging satellites in different phases of the spectrum with different temporal resolution. So a vast variety uh, with a lot of data, which many of those are in the open. I'm not referring to surveillance satellites in particular. And uh, the challenge is, what do we do with these data? And the digital actually enables the, uh, the data to be available, but also some sort of, allow me the term of app stores for space, huh? because we have now cloud services that put together data and also algorithms and allow developing businesses. And so predictive analytics do not necessarily have a downside because we use modeling, for example, to simulate evolution of the climate, have what-if scenarios in order to take informed decisions. So uh, this is my comment, but I understand your point uh, um, from before. Um, a point, uh, the point that was raised on uh, policy makers and lawmaking, uh, I would like to make the distinction between the importance of lawmaking to set a tone or a direction without overdoing it with red tape, mm. but then the importance of implementation. And the key to success is that implementation needs to come from the economy. This is all what Europe is about. It has to come from value-added uh, SMEs, startups, big industry, and so on. This is the key to success. Um, the policy makers uh, are, do not have the mandate to actually use the data. They need information to take decisions, or they need to make sure that law is smart in order to optimize the assets that we have. But then it's all about how do we put enabling factors to implement all this. If we look at market projections, uh, everything which is support to governmental services, let's say, is probably on the downside of the market projections on the space economy, but uh, the, the bulk, let's say, should come from other, let's say, from the transformation of our society. And the young talent, of course, is key in, in preparing the right skill set, cooperation with the universities and so on. And I finish with um, the, point, uh, the point that you raised. I think as we go towards next year, Certainly this year we can still say that the issue of protection of our society is, uh, is uh, of enormous value. We are still under deep crisis mm. uh, and a war on European territory. Uh, the issue of closest, closeness to citizens and including how societies organize the regions, the cities and so on remains of high importance and a big challenge for the European project. And uh, the issue of transformation remains a big challenge uh, because of the climate dimension. And I believe uh, that in all this, space can be a true enabler. It's a source of inspiration for young talent. It's a, it's a huge source of solutions if we use it in the, in the proper way. So raising the importance of space as an enabler in these uh, challenges that we have is extremely important. ESA recently published Revolution Space. And, uh, and we have some sort of a road show. Uh, we recently had an, an event in Vienna, very successful, to actually show that you know, there is much more than we have ever imagined. So with this, I finish here. Great. Um, thank you. Um, thank you all.
Um, time is obviously um, um, not with me because it's now five to one according to this little clock I've got. The new mentor started lunch <coughs> 10 minutes ago, so my apologies for that. Um, colleagues, I hope you found these first two sessions um, rewarding, stimulating, effective, but also thoughtful um, in, in you know, looking and reflecting at space, both in terms of, you know, here we are on European soil, our values matter, and therefore our, our, our functionality, our engagement, our exploration, and what we do around space should be guided by those values. And now in this session, we've looked at how can you use the kind of the burgeoning pace of AI um, and as uh, data to support one of our biggest challenges on this dear, lovely planet of ours, which is climate change. So I hope you've had so, you know, food for thought. The thing that we keep on coming back to is politics and citizens. And I think that, 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 that the dynamic needs to be resolved urgently and quickly, uh, because next year, obviously, we have the European parliamentary elections. It could be the biggest festival of disinformation in Europe. It could be. You're going to have 20%, 20%, first time ever, 20% new time voters, young voters, um, and then you're going to have this uh, absolute dramatic tension between older communities and younger communities with a very di who've come with a very different context and life experience. But what we do know is that this lovely project with the values that are underpinning it is subject to rogue actors that do want to under, uh, undermine it. So it can be the biggest festival of disinformation. Let's hope that together with the space agency and others, like you've helped in Ukraine, you know, in a way, as you, I'm glad you made the point about defense security, you know, people don't know uh, how much space technology has been able to, I suppose, help the war effort uh, that's on our doorstep. And we need to think carefully and seriously about the impact of um, security and space. Um, and the fact that, it's, it, and I know I've raised the question about lawmakers, but it's a really important one. Um, you know, individual lawmakers ain't going to work actually for the citizen because the, the the potential for doing damage is borderless. Let's put it that way. So, but on that high point, um, thank you all for being here. That's the end of the show from me. You're going to have lunch, and then you know now we're going to turn our attention after lunch. So please don't disappear. After lunch, we move to Africa. And we want you know think about the importance the importance of Africa as an opportunity um, and uh, a way to partner and work differently and actually I suppose look beyond the historic approach to Africa from Europe and think about it more in terms of an issue of reciprocity um, you know interdependence and a knowledge sharing uh, uh, opportunity but also to create a different flank of support so you know Europe often looks to the um, the west or the east what we strongly urge that we should look to the south for our future uh, safety, security, and inclusive growth. Colleagues, thank you very much for being with us, and enjoy your lunch, and thank you, and I shall, um, thank you. Yes. So please make your way up. Thank you.
Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. I hope you had a good lunch break. Maybe I can encourage you to actually come closer as uh, we have, a, I think, a smaller um, attendance as well this, uh, this afternoon. So uh, welcome to this uh, third and uh, last session uh, that has a specific focus on uh, Africa-Europe cooperation on space. And also, I would like to say good afternoon for those who are joining us uh, online today. And I hope you also enjoyed the, the conversation so far. Uh, my name is uh, Holly Rene Vozanani, and I'm the head of Outreach Advocacy and Partnerships at the Africa Rub Foundation. So for those who don't know us yet, we are an independent platform for multi-stakeholder dialogue, frank debate, and uh, strategic analysis and focusing on Africa-Europe relations. Uh, we've been co-founded as well by Friends of Europe and the Moy Brain Foundation uh, in partnership with the One Campaign and the African Climate Foundation. So I'm really delighted to be moderating this um, panel today and really to explore together the role of space technology and data to of course support informed decision making but also understanding the current challenges and identifying how uh, to foster Africa-Europe cooperation at different levels. Of course, for better alignment on policy, but as well to look into uh, specific partnerships around, for instance, Earth observation. So, of course, looking at these necessary tools um, that look into pursuing sustainable management of resources, looking at, as well, satellite navigation, looking at satellite communication, looking at space science and astronomy, uh, particularly with a greater focus on partnership on radio astronomy, for instance. One thing to, of course, remind us a little bit is um, the Africa-Europe space cooperation is not something new. Uh, but 2023 is absolutely an important year, a pivotal year, uh, because there are definitely more opportunities as well for us to innovate, to share knowledge, share expertise, uh, to better coordinate, of course. Uh, and this is particularly with the launch of the um, African Space Agency earlier this year that, of course, reinforces the importance given by Africa and the African Union around space affairs, and also its ambition, of course, to encourage more international partnerships. So you've have seen that today really comes at a very timely manner, and I'm very delighted to introduce our panelists today. So uh, joining us online, uh, live from Zimbabwe, we have Rovimbo Samanga, who is an attorney working with the Space Law and Policy Project Group Space at Space Generation. Welcome, uh, Rovimbo. And uh, joining us here in Brussels uh, in person, so we have Rania uh, Tukebri, who is actually the regional uh, coordinator for Africa at the Space Generation Advisory Council, and as well, you know, the space woman uh, mentor, and as well, project manager at Airbus uh, Defense Space. Welcome. Please join us here on stage. We also have Giuseppe Ottavianelli, who is the head of the Earth Observation Application Sections at the European Space Agency. Please welcome. And we have uh, Sekou Wedraogo, who is the president of the African Aeronautics and Space uh, Organization. Welcome uh, to all of us here. So um, I think today, as mentioned, it's a very exciting uh, conversation that we'd like to have. And I would like to kick off it with you, uh, Giuseppe, particularly because you manage the African framework for research, innovation, communities, and application. And also you've been working on new Earth observations application for social benefits and very much at the heart of this engagement um, with African partners. And you've seen as well, of course, the growth, um, I think, on the African space economy and the partnerships that actually went together with the European Space Agency. So can you tell us more, maybe a lot, about this, this framework and the partnership that, um, that you've seen so far? Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thanks for the invitation. Um, I always like to put things into context, and uh, specifically on those uh, circumstances that today we have uh, that I, I call often the alignments of the planets, you know, those uh, enabling and, and facilitating factors that allow things to move forward and move forward fast. Um, the first one is the, the new impetus that 
came uh, to be following uh, the, the Lisbon Manifest in, in June 2021 uh, on uh, Earth observation uh, for Africa and Europe. So that allowed, of course, the, um, the setting of the progressive definition and implementation of what we have today as the EC Global Gateway with the African Space Flagship uh, and its three pillars, and as well all the activities from the EU uh, Global Action on Space by DigiDefis. Another of these planets is certainly, as you mentioned, the African Space Agency uh, creation that will inevitably bring cohesion uh, at continental scale of the African Space Program. And at ESA, we had a strengthening uh, of the investments for R&D, also with an attention on, on Africa. And ESA is now also sitting on the African Union Commission uh, Policy Coordinator Advisory Council uh, in the GMS and Africa Phase Two program. This overall landscape uh, related to space is also perfectly matching uh, the, the Africa Agenda 2063. Basically, this is bringing the Pan-African vision uh, and, and drive to, for unity in Africa, for self-determination, and for collective prosperity. Um, from, uh, let's say, an inclusive, uh, um, all-inclusive uh, approach, but also from a sustainable approach in the long term. And this is also, uh, as one of the last elements of this alignment of planets, is also what is happening in industry in Africa. Um, the latest report from 2022 uh, is showing that the satellite and space industry is valued about 20 billion uh, US dollars. Uh, we have seen a growth, uh, well, it, the projection of growth is about 16% by 2026. Uh, and we have seen in the last just four years an increase of um, uh, about 80% of what are the budgets from the various nations in Africa allocated to space operations and activities. You mentioned also uh, the, the, um, the new space economy. There was a recent conference in Abidjan. Uh, we have seen at the moment that there are mapped about 270 new space companies that are really charting the route of what we can call democratization of space as well. So this is certainly a flourishing and booming um, moment for Africa. And as I said, this alignment of a vision from Africa 20, you know, Africa Agenda 2063, clear objectives with impact for society, collaboration and partnerships between um, uh, Europe and Africa, and clear actions as well with industry, it's creating a very unique setting. A setting that I believe from the African perspective creates a level of opportunity which is some, somewhat limitless. So there is a lot of space for, for action, for translating dreams into uh, clear uh, objectives. ESA, as you mentioned, has uh, now is implementing uh, the, this initiative called EO Africa, where Africa is an acronym, in fact. Um, what is it? I would say, uh, if I would have to summarize this uh, briefly, it's about listening. It's about listening to the African needs. So it's, it's a user-driven R&D initiative that allows empowerment. We listen to the heterogeneous stakeholders in Africa. So you can imagine that we, we are already heterogeneous in Europe. And in, in Africa, certainly, the dimension uh, is very similar to the one in Europe, with different in, in, in uh, um, social economic conditions, different in technology development, different in type of investments that each nation does. And what we do is we implement uh, a capacity development. I like to call it capacity deployment in R&D through R&D actions. So we, we have a number of different actions that we do. We host at ESA African Research Fellows. We started this initiative last year. We have hosted two uh, African Research Fellows last year. We will have four more uh, fellows next year. Um, we implement face-to-face -face training, uh, responding to the user needs that have been captured directly in, in um, dialogue with the African stakeholders. We provide access to innovation labs, which are uh, virtual labs where 
a number of researchers can hands-on use space data. And then we fund R&D actions from uh, technology-driven type of application developments using hyperspectral data or thermal data, but also looking at a regional, national, or even continental scale type of projects. So what we are doing now is identifying additional future investments. What is the perimeter for ESAO that we can further expand? And this is, let's say, of course, uh, an ongoing process. And here I would like to share three of these points. The first one is to really continue on pioneering and investing on applications and services, bringing together Earth observation, navigation, and telecommunication assets together with a clear focus, a focus that puts nature and people at the center of certain business and policy decisions. So that's, I believe, where Europe and Africa can invest together. There are three topics here that I would like to bring to the attention. First is the climate resilience and climate adaptation topic with clear actions. The second one is nature capital valuation, so attaching monetary valuation to ecosystem services, potentially creating a full market and economy around this. Nature finance is developing very fast. There are a number of schemes that are being addressed, developed. Uh, one that we have seen recently being applied, it's also a nature debt swap. So something very interesting where Earth observation can provide transparent, measurable um, uh, products. And the last, of course, is the green transition. So uh, this is, these are the three topics. All these applications are, of course, leveraging a certain technology, cloud computing, AI. <clears throat> so this is a great revolution in the era of big data. Blockchain that will also help in building and strengthening the trust of Earth observation or space-based assets uh, for the end users. All the open science approaches and, of course, the advanced modeling with the digital twin Earth components uh, that will have to be developed. The second element where I think ESA can certainly strengthen is sharing the know-how about space engineering. It's about sharing. It's about also learning new things from the African entities on how they operate, how they develop uh, new programs, and so it's a mutual exchange of sharing in terms of manufacturing, testing, launchers, um, about concurrent engineering, about ground segment developments. So all these aspects are certainly an area that can be further explored in the future years to come. If I think about even some um, edge computing, so uh, AI on board of satellites, so at the edge, very close to the sensor. This is something that we are exploring at the moment, but something that can be shared. And the last point is about the experience ongoing in Europe about commercialization. So again, uh, it's not about preaching of how things should be done, but it's about a mutual learning process. Uh, it's about industrial competitiveness in Africa. It's about supporting investments, uh, schemes like Incubed or ScaleUp at INISA can certainly also be shared in terms of know-how, and also the potential PPP, uh, public-public partnerships that can be established and where you know, this, this experience um, can be beneficial for the African continent. So with that, I stop and indeed um, welcome question or remarks. Thank you very much, Giuseppe. So what we hear indeed that there are a lot of technologies that are already being developed out there to actually uh, also look into specific issues linked with uh, sustainable development, for instance. But we've seen as well lots of increasing investment uh, in these uh, space products and as well uh, or into uh, satellite launches, for instance. And that would make me uh, bring it to, to you, uh, Rovimbo. So uh, Rovimbo, particularly you hear about this kind of increasing investment um, in space uh, technologies um, 
in space affairs in general. Um, and we'd like to see as well that you've been working on this uh, space law and regulation and any other uh, legislation actually governing space-related activities. So although we know that there is no claim, for instance, in terms of uh, sovereignty in space, and we've seen this incre um, increasing investment uh, online everywhere. So can you tell us more maybe about the importance um, that you see, the challenges, but as well the opportunities uh, related to uh, regulating space activities in particular, and how do you see the Africa-Europe collaboration will play out on this issue? Over to you, uh, Rovimbo. I'm afraid we cannot hear you. Can you try again, please? So, Rovimbo, we're checking with the technical team. Can you try again? Unfortunately, we cannot hear. So maybe trying to, to reconnect, and can I can maybe come back to you um, in a sec, uh, Ravimbo. So sorry about that. So looking forward to, to hearing um, your, your contribution. So um, moving on, uh, actually, I would like to um, continue the, the conversation directly that we've been hearing, of course, this uh, partnership that Giuseppe, you've been mentioning around Africa and Europe, and uh, particularly with you, uh, Rania, you have a, not even a double, but I think uh, three um, kind of hats um, that we've been seeing uh, on your work. So we'd like to understand a little bit from, you know, on the, um, la I would say, on the agency that you've been working on and as well within the UN system, on the, as well, the uh, private uh, sector bit. How do you see, uh, I would say, that collaboration, particularly around Africa, Europe? What do you see are the needs uh, that would come? I think Giuseppe mentioned a couple of them. So how do we need to kind of bridge these needs and what are the opportunities for collaboration? Yeah, so the mic is over there. Thank you. Okay, it's already on. So uh, thank you so much for this question. Um, yes, true. So the, the, the fact that I'm already working in the private sector um, here in Europe and also I'm working attached to Africa as regional coordinator for SDAC is probably allowing me to see things a bit in, in both ways. So what we do in Africa right now is we are currently building the African Space Agency, which is something great we didn't have before. So the thing is that we are seeing things that Europe has been seeing many years ago. So we are starting from a place in which we are trying to learn what has Europe done before in order probably not to repeat the same mistakes or at least to reduce a bit the amount of time we lost. So Africa right now, in order to make any kind of collaborations and partnerships with any, uh, any other parties is basically to try to kick off this discussion in which there is a real understanding of what she needs. So the things, what Africa needs or the priority of Africa is the thing that we have to put all space applications for, either from Europe side or from any other parties as well. So what we need currently is the basics, the security, the food and water access, and also the collaborations for other economic development for the region. And of course, the climate change. This is something we have to just to put a focus on, of course. The thing is that we can use the space applications for this, and mainly the segments that Africa has adapted through a report, the African Union Commission, many years ago. The report is saying clearly that there is basically four segments or three main segments we can use space applications for, we can invest for which are basically the Earth observation, the navigation and positioning satellites, and the science and technology development. So if you already try to see these segments, you can already understand what kind of satellites you need, how much budget you need to, to do for this. We have been trying to support um, Africa, and I'm, I'm going to talk a bit on the side of the industry. So when we try to build any kind of satellites, we try to see what's the mission for. For Copernicus site, there is certain instruments we try to use for certain aspects, for climate change, for Galileo right now. So we are currently in Airbus building the second generation of Galileo, which is, um, I think, the most precise navigation satellites, correct me if I'm wrong. So, and this is something we can use 
for, for any, any region in Europe, in Africa, everywhere. So the thing is that when you try to adapt, you find the proper space application, space technology or satellite to be more precise, you are already gaining in all sides. In Africa side, you cover the need. In Europe side, you already have a project going on. We are learning, as I heard from Frédéric yesterday and today, we are learning through the new technology we have. We are seeing different perspectives. And of course, in order to do all this, we do need clear pillars or clear framework. The main pillars, if you just ignore one of them, you already lost the entire game. So there should be a clear governance in Africa in order to put everything clearly from the beginning. Maybe Rumbo can develop this a bit more later. There should be also a clear understanding how will be the international collaborations, what are the limits, what you should do, what you should not do, and also regarding the capacity building, and here I'm talking about what UNUSA is doing. I heard today a question asking, what's UNUSA doing, or what's the role of uh, certain organizations, public or let's say international organizations? It's that. It's educating. It's mentoring. It's just maybe exposing a few, few things that we in Africa we don't see probably. Its mentorship is now becoming the first priority of Africa because the local capacity still need expertise. And these people, they are, it's, if you already try to do this mentorship and education properly, you ha already have the human resources to be the satellites locally. And that's the thing is that you need to do balance between the internal capacity building, building your own local capacities, and at the same time making the international collaborations. And I guess if you keep that balance, I guess there should be a gain from all parties. There will be no issue, I guess, on long term. Now, we're not talking about the five next years, we're talking about 30 and 50 years later, how the space market will be. And just, I won't take too long, but it's the idea here is basically to put all together, the industry, um, the, the government, and also people from organizations that we cannot just ignore one party, we have to include everybody there. And if you want to have a, a um, let's say, in my opinion, a successful project is a project in which you are putting your budget, your money in the proper place for the proper need. If you already cover this, I think we will have a successful, 100% successful project. Thank you very much, Rania, that, that's very clear. And you actually uh, mentioned a couple of times about the budget, about the funding. So uh, obviously, of course, as we see this increasing uh, investment in space technology, we need the associated, uh, indeed, uh, money and resources uh, that goes with it. And this is actually a question uh, from uh, Chris from United Kingdom, so uh, a citizen that actually was very interested in, um, in the topic. And uh, his question I would like to address to uh, the three of you here uh, is about um, space in Europe is picking up speed. So we've heard that definitely from Giuseppe, uh, offering the opportunity to connect and sustain us even more. Given the European value of sharing, how do we apply space funding on the continent in such a way that it benefits not just Europe, but the global community? Maybe this is something that uh, the three of you can also touch upon. How do you see that space funding really affecting? How do we need to prioritize as well the space funding so that you can reap uh, the benefits uh, for the society, particularly in Africa? I don't know who would like to start. Giuseppe? Some clear examples. I think uh, certainly the um, EU and, and uh, ESA Copernicus program has showed how open and free data uh, becomes really a public value to society. And so a, a clear European investment is creating a springboard uh, for uh, benefits around the world, irrespectively of uh, the nations being using that data. Uh, the same applies for, for Galileo. So um, this, this openness in terms of uh, sharing uh, also from the open science perspective. So the, the understanding of the Earth system is not something that should be um, proprietary to a nation to, or to a continent. And so open science and open innovation are the tools to bring forward uh, in, in the decades to come. 
Um, and I think this shall be mirrored by the policies that are being set, uh, uh, which can then uh, you know, allow clear course of actions following uh, those clear values of openness and, and sharing. Thank you very much. Rania, Seku, is there something else you would like to add on this uh, funding aspect on how to prioritize this for the benefits of Africa? Um, I guess this is not only the point of Africa, it's also the same for Europe. Um, okay, I, I, okay, I always say the same things. We have already in Africa, many countries already taken the lead and sending so many satellites and doing great things for the moon. That's fantastic, but there is also other countries struggling to kick off their first project. So um, I would e even mention a few countries that have no space product that are still consumers of space. So how we can use the funding is first thing, in my opinion, is through certain organism or certain centralized bodies, who is basically the African Space Agency. The, the, these people will be like, um, people will be coordinating, let's say, the program, the projects, in a way to do things in the proper way. Of course, they will not be able to decide on their own, like the member states, of course, should do this themselves, but they will give at least the guidance in order to put exactly, that's, that's the thing, to have to, to put the budget or to put the funding on the proper project. And here, some countries, some institutions don't have the experience to do this and don't have the technical expertise and also strategic expertise. And that's, that's the main goal of having an, an agency and also having some, some regional, international bodies to, to, to be there. That's the role of using the resources in the proper way. That, that's great. Thanks, thanks very much. And um, I would like to turn now to you, uh, Seku, uh, because we've been already mentioned several times now the, the launch of this uh, uh, African uh, Space Agency and how we need to also benefit from, uh, from different expertise, of course, and share. Uh, so it goes uh, both ways. And we definitely see that this is a sign of uh, increasing importance um, of the space industry. Uh, and I would like to understand maybe from your perspectives, if you see definitely upcoming priorities for the partnership as well between uh, two continents, and if there is any gaps that you think that still need to be bridged. Thank you very much. I prepare a short uh, speech. Um, so thank you to have invited me uh, to this uh, um, panel. Before beginning, uh, I would want to present a short presentation uh, of the African space field, because it's important to, to know what we talk about. So today, we, there are 21 uh, African countries with a space program. So Algeria, Angola, Botswana, Burkina Faso, Djibouti, Libya, Ethiopia, Gabon, Ghana, Ivory Coast, Kenya, Egypt, Mauritius, Morocco, Nigeria, Rwanda, South of Africa, Sudan, Tunisia, Uganda, Zimbabwe. 15 African countries have launched a national satellite. 46 national satellites have been launched by Africa country. And the last one is the Kenya's uh, nation ones a few months ago. So the most expensive satellite uh, uh, ever launched is the Morocco uh, Mohamed Sis uh, Air Observation Satellite. The cost is the 5 million of euro. The cheapest satellite uh, is the Ghanasat 1 nanosatellite. It costs 50,000 uh, euro. In the last five years, we had a 360% increase in the number of African satellites. So the African space economy in 2021 uh, is um, $90.49 billion, dollars, and is project to grow up uh, by 16.16%. Uh, the industry employs uh, 19,000 people across the continent. There are uh, 272 new space companies are chartering the course of space demarcation on the continent. Um, it's important to know that because it uh, shows the, the, the space uh, field in Africa. So uh, what could be the access of collaboration between Africa and Europe? And what could be the potential areas for a partnership between the two continents? 
So to be honest, uh, I don't know all axes of collaboration between the, the both continents. Uh, that's possible. To, that's not possible to give you uh, this complete list in five uh, minutes. But I can speak about one of the main uh, effective collaboration uh, in the field of Africa and Europe space collaboration, the global monitoring for environment and security and Africa called GMS and Africa program. Why? Because for me, this is the most significant and complete EU Africa space program uh, who have been ever designed. And it is the best example uh, of what we have done and what we have to keep on doing. The GMS and Africa program is one of the key actors of the Africa and Europe for space affair relationship. So uh, launch in uh, 2007 following the Mapito declaration uh, in 2006. Sixth, stressing the need for a new Africa partnership and space as part of the Copernicus uh, program, the GMS and Africa initiative provide a framework for a long-standing cooperation between both continents in space science and technology and health observation. Alors, indeed, you talk about the uh, funding of space uh, affairs. The, this program costs uh, 30 million of euro. It's financed by uh, the Europe Commission and African Union. So uh, it came after three former programs of Earth Observation Corporation. The first one since uh, 2001 is PUMA. You know PUMA? Okay. So it means preparation for the use of Meteostat second generation in Africa from uh, 2001 to 2006. After AMES uh, from 2007 to 2030 and uh, MESA from 2030 to 2017. So in April uh, 2040, during the fourth year uh, Africa Summit, a cooperation, a cooperation agreement was signed by the European Union and African Union Commission for the implementation of GMS in Africa. So the first phase has taken place from two, 2017 to 2021. The phase two of this program we last from 2021 to 2025. So the GMS and Africa program is very important. The, this aim is to promote the development of the local capabilities and institutional, human, and technical resources for the access and exploration of the Earth observation-based services on an operational basis. So uh, this program is designed to specifically address African needs for water, natural resources, marine and coastal services, to meet global environment management needs, ensure civil, civil security, enable the implementation of the African space policy and strategy. So uh, this program is very important. This is the vehicle for the implementation of the Chain Africa Euro strategy and space strategies and policy in Africa. So uh, aligned with the aspiration seven of the African Union Agenda 2063. You talked about it a few minutes ago. Under this initiative, uh, 12 consortia composed of uh, 112 African institutions have been identified for their expertise and representativeness to operate the GMS in Africa objective. That's why it's an important program and the main important program in, a, in the, the way of the partnership between Africa and EU. There's uh, 12 uh, consortia in the five regions of Africa who deal with uh, water and natural resources and coastal and marine on uh, maritime management. Voilà. One of the interesting initiatives uh, from GMS and Africa is the GMS and Africa Africa, GMS and Africa Academic Networks, composed of African diaspora professors, engineers, experts to provide in all Africa space courses about EU data. It means knowledge, applications, tools and capability building in Africa through the 12 consortia and other African institutions. 
There's another initiative. This is the Women and GMS in Africa initiative. Its mission is to increase the number of women, capacity enhancement opportunities, and the promotion of gender inclusion in the implementation of the GMS in Africa program and beyond. I think we can. No, I maybe I we can come back later. Thing. On it's interesting uh, because on it's, it's not a lot of uh, known. It's important to speak about it because there's a lot of things we done uh, in the continent and the relationship between Europe and Africa is very strong since uh, more than 20 years. So it's important to explain to the auditors what it, uh, in what it consists. So um, what could be the potential areas for the partnership between the two continents. This is my point of view. So there are four axes for this uh, space collaboration that could be de developed for the win-win collaboration between the both continents. The first one is a focus on youth participation, mobility, and employability. It means design some initiative to develop the training and the capacity building of the African youth about space application. Use it, for example, to support female leadership, permit to the women to believe in the space as a way for their own emancipation. Developing the private sectors for providing job for youth, developing space startup contests are good initiative to support the African space diaspora who will want to train or invest in Africa in creating local companies uh, could be a good initiative. The second one is to reinforce the African-Europe Climate Alliance with a focus on a partnership around climate change, sustainable energy and agri-food system. Indeed, space application will have to be more used to fight against the climate change and its effects on our life. We shouldn't forget that the basin of the Congo is the second production place of oxygen all over the world after Amazonia. The first one is a, a cross-continental health partnership with an aim to common goals for universal health coverage. Remote medicine can help everyone in the world to avoid or treat illness. And the last one will be to ref reframe perception and mindset around the relationship uh, between both continents makes better known what space tools can bring to the development of Europe and Africa through some ambition projects, or even smaller projects, more close to people. Many thanks, Seku. I think that is um, a really comprehensive overview uh, of you know, the cooperation and what needs to happen next. And I would like to bring it uh, back, Rovimbo. Uh, Rovimbo, if uh, you can say a couple of words and if we can hear you, and uh, to actually have you indeed comment on uh, the aspect around the legislation and, and regulation that is also crucial in this Africa-Europe uh, partnerships and also on space. Over to you, Rovimbo. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Perfectly. Thank you. Thank you so much and thank you for your patience. I'll start by giving a bit of a landscape mapping of the current space treaties and their importance in this regard. I think first we can look at the main space treaties of which there are five and glean from there that they provide a robust international law framework, especially for states as the main actors. These, without any particular order, include the Outer Space Treaty, the Liability Convention, the Rescue Agreement, the, as well the Registration Agreement and the Moon Agreement. What we see then is the Outer Space Treaty comes off as a constitutory document that helps states sort of create an environment or an enabling environment for the multi-stakeholder initiatives that we see in outer space. I'd like to draw your attention specifically to Article 6 of the Outer Space Treaty, which gives a precise mandate to states to supervise the activities of non-governmental entities. So that is creating that enabling environment. To support these binding international treaties, we also have five non-binding rules, which are very intellectual suggestions on how states can further regulate more niche industries 
And we can touch here on remote sensing principles as one example that can support the Earth observation industry in particular. Some of the lesser known international treaties that can be called upon also include the UN Charter, and this relates to the peaceful uses of outer space of which peace and security are large and similar democratic values seen in both the African Union and the European Union. We also see the ICJ statute, which regulates the dispute resolution mechanism, and also the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. I would say that the latter, especially in Article 32, emphasizes the role that state practice has in developing new le legislation. State practice, of course, implies that as more states continue to adopt different customs in outer space, these can form binding principles on all other states. What I think deserves more inclusion as well as the role of industry practice, as we see now more industry-led norms, especially in the rapidly growing fields of earth observation and telecommunications. So I'll be focusing on two elements, namely the governance aspect, looking at digital and data governance, and cooperation, of which my colleagues have already emphasized the importance of mutual reciprocity. And I'd like to give a bit of an insight into Africa's values, following especially the documentary landscape. The African Union itself holds the ambition of driving an integrated, prosperous, and peaceful Africa driven by its own citizens and representing a dynamic force in the global arena. And as is commonly known, there are 55 member states. The European Union values and principles also include freedom, democracy, equality, and the rule of law promoting peace and stability. And of course, there are 27 member states. There are similarities in the three governance branches, and we can add there, as already mentioned, the African Space Agency, which falls under the AU Outer Space Program. I'll then like, take a look at some of the documents which have a hinging on the space industry. Starting, of course, with the AU Handbook. Under Article 3 of the Constitutive Act of the African Union, and the protocol to the act, I would like to look at some union objectives that are important for this discussion. Firstly, to accelerate political and socioeconomic integration. Secondly, to encourage international cooperation. And thirdly, to promote peace and security and stability on the continent, whilst creating the necessary conditions to do so. My colleagues have also alluded to Agenda 2063, which is Africa's blueprint and master plan for transforming Africa into the global powerhouse of the future. Some of its goals and priorities include, as already mentioned, Aspiration 7, which is an Africa as a strong, united, resilient, and influential global player and partner. Perhaps deserving more mention is the Africa Free Continental Trade Area. 54 member states have signed, 46 parties, and this agreement has the potential to lift 30 million people out of extreme poverty. It is the largest trade agreement since the World Trade Organization was established, and it has a combined potential GDP of 3.4 United States dollars, 3.4 billion United, sorry, 3.4 trillion United States dollars, my apologies. With this document, we hope to facilitate goods, services, dispute resolution, customs, and trade facilitation. My colleagues have already expounded on Earth observation and positioning and navigation, so I'd like to take a look at digital transformation, especially in light of telecommunications. It is undoubted that Africa is the fastest growing digital market, the reasons why being that it has legacy challenges which require quicker adoption. As well, did you know that the average age of Africa is 19.6 years, and that by 2050, one in four people will be African? In this way, organizations that want to be competitive both in Africa and globally should begin to strategize on how to cater for this growing population. So what are some of the policies we can look towards, both in terms of trade, the digital industry, and the space industry? There needs to be a harmonization of policies, which we hope the African Space Agency will fulfill. Implementation of laws, policies, and regulations to stimulate and accelerate digital transformation transformation, and finally, enable the coherence of future and existing digital policies. All this in order to onboard the over 200 million currently without internet access, which would result in massive GDP 
economic productivity, and gender equality. I will then conclude my shortery piece by stating that according to the World Bank study, it is estimated that for every 10% increase in broadband penetration in low and middle income countries results in a commensurate increase of 1.38% of the GDP. Thus, we need to look forward thinking and with our partners to also build capacity. Already mentioned is the Global Gateway. I'll also mention PRIDA, which is a 10 million euro project funded by the European Commission. The EU's goal is for Europe to be the most connected by 2030, and we hope to learn from our partners. Lastly, according to a report by Google and the International Finance Corporation, Africa's digital economy has the potential to contribute nearly 180 billion United States dollars, which is 5.2% of the continent's GDP by 2025. We certainly hope that we would have created a policy environment worthy of this by then. Thank you. I'll end there. Thank you very much, uh, Ravimbo, for uh, making the case about indeed this importance uh, of having a policy and legislation framework and to look into uh, digital transformation and how we can uh, definitely address some of the common challenges that we had across both continents. Now I'm turning to the audience um, and trying to understand if there is any question, uh, statements, reactions um, that you would like to share as well uh, with the panelists. So. Any question, comments? There is a question over there, yeah. Yeah, of course, uh, I'm Mr. Baruti, and involved in peace building and conflict prevention. And as you can see, I'm Africa, <laughs> that is why I, I prefer to react. First, on the issue of uh, space and uh, technology and application, in Africa, where the issue is considered by authorities that, uh, as a sensitive issue and uh, defense issue, and from time to time, the economic issue. So uh, when uh, Samang has uh, uh, addressed the issue of uh, harmonization, it's, it belongs to African leaders and with the the help of the scientific, multidisciplinary scientific community to uh, solve this issue Inter between Africa first and um, uh, make a, a, a clear option like uh, Rana uh, mentioned, a clear option to say this issue should be did with uh, uh, military uh, uh, aspect, this issue with uh, economic aspect, this issue with communication aspect. That is that the comment, the first comment I, I have, but I can add more <laughs> depending of the evolution of the, the discussion. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. So it's a comment about the use of internet as a sensitive issue in Africa. Is there any other question or comment from uh, the audience? that we can take. There is a question over there. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for the very clear and, uh, and motivating presentations. A comment and a question. A comment, I know that this year is the, the African Free ACFTA year, the year of int integrating the market. This year also marks the 30th anniversary of the single market of the European Union. So I think this could be potentially one area of, of synergy. Question, um, this whole c conference started off as a title of Geopolitics, Big Data, Innovation. I'd just like to ask the geopolitics question to the panel and ask, how do you compare the EU with other geopolitical actors when it comes to the digital area? Um, how, how does the EU compare with other... Oh, maybe, maybe I rephrase that. Um, in, in Africa, how do you see the geopolitical landscape, especially on digital? So that's the EU, US, China, India, and others. Question is, maybe just a short one, is on digital dependency. We heard about this morning about strategic autonomy and resilience, but 
how do you see the dynamics of uh, being dependent on critical infrastructure on, uh, on certain players? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, who would like to kick off the question here on the panel? One question around the uh, geopolitics, um, how you were compared with other partners, uh, particularly looking at um, digital issues and the, all the questions around digital dependency. Would like to kick off uh, Giuseppe. So, again, it's a matter, I think, of heterogeneous approach that we have in Africa with respect to um, the investments that are being made. Um, and I think there are many also untapped opportunities out there. Um, the same applies for Europe. Uh, we have seen recently the launch with DigiConnect of Destiny. And something very similar could be done as well in Africa. So in a way, space is not about space. Space is about providing solutions, providing new knowledge, allowing um, the human capacity development in a country or in a continent, and therefore wealth and prosperity in a way. So space is not for space itself, right? Um, the opportunities that I was talking and I was uh, thinking about is, for example, what happened in, in Nigeria just two months ago. There was an initiative, I think it's called Initiative on Digital Enterprises, uh, 600 million of investments specifically for um, uh, digital technology and the creative sector. There is nothing is mentioned about space. So creating these this nice links across uh, different industries, uh, not necessarily the one of, you know, that is already engaged with the space dialogue, could be a, a, a nice uh, way of amplifying the use of uh, space assets. Um, the point on, on, on the digital dependency, um, if certain sectors uh, are fully dependent on, on certain digital technologies, and th that infrastructure must be safeguarded to the uttermost uh, level. Uh, in a f with a full uh, appreciation of, of what a, an operational service means. It might mean full backup of certain assets in a, in a hot standby until, you know, if there is a failure, things can be activated immediately. Um, now, if we look at the public uh, uh, it's a, a, and private dimension, I think the public sector there has a very strong responsibility and needs to um, ensure certain um, conditions then for the private sector then to build on and therefore flourish. So those responsibilities, and if we're looking at Europe, is you know the, the various partners in Europe in the space domain, from from the European Union bodies, uh, UMETSAT, uh, SATSEN, uh, ESA, uh, ECMWF. So it, so many players that together must feel that responsibility. The same applies in Africa. So now with the African Space Agency. This understanding, this appreciation is very important because it will unleash, let's say, great growth from the um, uh, private domain. And, and working together is, is the way forward, so. Rania? Um, I prefer not going to too much deeply into geopolitical um, answers because I'm not, first of all, the expert and I prefer not talking about this. Okay, I, I would like just to answer both of your questions with three elements. The first one is basically the governance. So if the governance is well dealt in regional and local level, it's going to put everything clear from the beginning. There won't be any ambiguity or issue. The second thing is, of course, the regulation. Uh, very clear regulation done, of course, this in the same way um, on a local level and on a regional level. And the other thing I have just mentioned is the balancing at the same time the local project that should be done by the locals, basically. And at the same time, making very good international collaborations. 
And here when I say international, so we usually, actually countries usually work with partners who they have trust with. When I had lots of conferences like last year uh, with, with AUC, the African Union Commission uh, people, and the, th the only thing they mentioned through international collaborations is this word, trust. So if you have already a partner, you had projects, previously projects with, and everything was already done successfully till the end, and you had no ambiguity with, of course we will have more projects with. And here, I will also point out the idea of coming up. We have now the private sector as well that is coming on board. This element is really going to solve lots of issues and is going to put everybody comfortable. So now we know lots of private sector leaders doing this work. Um, I won't say names, but actually there are already companies that are already helping a lot of African countries for... Um, internet connection, for net connectivity, for disasters management. And here we don't only talk about organism or United Nations or, or any other organism, uh, but we talk about a company that is just providing the technology that we need to solve a certain project, a certain problem. So here we go in, into problem solving um, technology, and that's what I mentioned. Here maybe I'm bringing maybe with things as very straightforward, I'm not going too much into framework, but that's the core. If you already know what, where we are going, we have already a clear framework for the next 30 years. And we have already clear partners who have certain technology we have that will solve the problem. I guess there won't be issues of uh, dependency uh, in, in the way, in the, let's say, the very negative way, or also any other issue in geopolitical situation. What we need in Africa is basically the stability, the economical growth, and, and the security. That's the only priority that we have right now. So I guess um, we, we won't add more on the table. So if, if, if any kind of space um, program is going to bring issues, I don't think that African countries have the capacity to go through it now. Thanks, Rania. Siku, would you like to comment? Well, I'm going to try to reply to the first question. Um, and what I can say, uh, as he told a few minutes ago, uh, space uh, is a sector as uh, others. Uh, nowadays, uh, Africa has a lot of collaboration with uh, a lot of different uh, countries. And uh, I think that the, the price of uh, space uh, tools is very important. Uh, most of the last uh, launcher as financed by a Chinese. Why? Because the price is very low, lower than, uh, for example, European uh, launcher. So it could be one of the reasons of uh, why they succeed, they, they, they accept to be helped by uh, Chinese, as in over different fields, not only the space, huh? in, the, in the trade, uh, in a, a lot of different um, fields of the economic. Uh, this is a um, the relationship between uh, uh, states, state to state, but uh, it depends on what we have to win in the relation. Space in, is uh, as uh, over the business uh, trade. This is what I can say. Thank you. I see that, Rovimbo, you're back. Uh, I'm not sure if you'd like to comment uh, on the questions around digital dependency, for instance, as you really enforce the role of a digital transformation, or the question around a geopolitics. Let us know. Yes, I think uh, perhaps I can opt for the digital dependency question and say that Africa already has a quite robust strategy framework, which I think will inspire confidence not only in the international community, but local stakeholders as well, and already emphasizes the role of multi-stakeholder uh, initiatives. But I'd also like to draw on the digital transformation strategy for Africa and highlight seven pillars that I think are important for continued EU-Africa cooperation. And the first being solid, solidarity and cooperation. There's also a comprehensive nature to agreements, a transformative nature, an inclusive nature, a homegrown nature, a new mindset, as already mentioned by Seku, and one initiative that is safe as well. And I think drawing from this also, we can look towards the African data policy framework where cooperation is needed to determine the full context of what data governance means for Africa. That is building a digital environment that ensures the protection of personal data, the right to privacy, and also allows for 
trustworthy development of emerging technologies, as mentioned by Giuseppe, that is artificial intelligence, blockchain, etc. Also to take note from the World Bank, uh, they estimate that achieving especially universal and high quality internet access throughout Africa would demand a staggering 100 billion United States dollars. So we see here that the role of especially uh, perhaps export import banks, the role of the institutions and also official development assistance is one that is necessary between this partnership in order to cure the digital dependency. And also we have to look at, again, the multi-stakeholder initiatives, whether that is operators, regulators, and governments around the world, which are constrained by the lack of infrastructure and the low foreseen probability due to high costs and low scalability and limited affordability. But for this, there is progress. 14 African countries have installed some form of 5G networks as of July, 2022. And while terrestrial and mobile infrastructures represent the main gate to internet access, there is steady development in that as well. We have 92 geo satellite internet providers in Africa, meaning there is a landscape that is accommodative to this kind of technology. So looking towards the oh, sorry, looking towards the global gateway, we hope to accelerate not only digital transition but also create jobs, strengthen health systems, and also improve education and training. To that extent, I think I'll end there on that point. Many thanks, Ravimbo. I think we're heading towards the end of um, this conversation, but we may take one last question from the audience. Any comment? Oh, there. Um, my question would be about the funding and um, the, uh, the stakes there is in terms of where the funding comes from and whether there is a risk. I've seen there's a lot of funding that comes from the U.S. as well. You've mentioned China. I think the U.S. is already positioned in quite a few countries in Africa. Is there a risk that the benefits of, of space in Africa are not reaped by the African populations and that the, the money funded from abroad goes back abroad? Or is that not necessarily um, a big concern? Who would like to address that question? on funding. Giuseppe? So, I oh, think Seco. it depends on the nature of the funding. If, for example, uh, a people uh, give the money to train, to train, for example, to train a, a student, it will uh, uh, directly um, go to the, to the people. But uh, if it's the money who gives uh, without uh, specific goals, it could be difficult. But it's a problem of, uh, it's a political problem. It's not a synthesis problem. Uh, this is human being who, who does the thing. So it depends on the way of collaboration. I think um, to make the money uh, goes directly to the to the development, you have to make some little smaller 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 projects directly to to make uh, application to the people. It will be more easier to see directly the the benefit of the fund. So I can only agree with Tseku, in fact. Uh, and uh, it, it's really the, 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 the approach of those investments and how things are being uh, deployed. In, uh, in the EO Africa experience, so building on the TIGER program and, and now EO Africa, it's about engaging the African end users, listening to the African stakeholder. And so we work in the full development chain from the co-design with the end user uh, being that the, a policy regulator, uh, uh, an environment protection agency, a national statistical office, or some other African uh, CSOs or NGOs. So we, we engage them in the development of the full project, co-design, development, val validation of the usefulness of the value-adding uh, results that we bring. So it's, it's, it's in the approach, yes. Th thank you very much. Um, and I would like just uh, maybe um, to mention that for this uh, the conversation that we had today, uh, it was very clear that um, 
Africa Europe cooperation has definitely had the potential to kind of unlock these great opportunities, whether that be around scientific collaboration, technology transfer, and as well socioeconomic development, while of course addressing common challenges that we have related to climate change, resource management, or even disaster response. So uh, we at the Africa Europe Foundation, of course, we're going to take stock uh, of the conversation today, and we're just uh, making sure that how it feeds, of course, in our ongoing work around the AU-EU uh, monitoring in on tracking on commitments that we do, and of course, on our general mission to foster renewed Africa-Europe relations. And particularly on the, on the topics that we discussed today, may that be around governance, regulatory frameworks, and as well strategic leadership. Around as well, we heard a lot about the importance, of course, of this international collaboration or youth-led initiatives, as well the role of youth uh, in the conversation, and something that probably would have deserved a longer conversation and something close to our Heart is about the women leadership uh, and also the participation in the space uh, economy and industry in general. So on that note, I would like to thank our panelists uh, here in Brussels, but as well live from uh, Zimbabwe for your contribution. And we hope very much uh, to keep in touch to see how we've been progressing as well with the conversation. And thanks for everyone attending here on site and for our online participants as well. Thank you.